Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the regulatory conference of Sigma 2018, sponsored by WH Partners, chaired by James Shikluna. regulatory conference. Um, well done for finding your way here. I understand it's quite labyrinthine outside there and there's a few bottlenecks. Um, but well done to uh, Sigma, Eman Police and his team for putting up this show once again. Um, in 2014, uh, when he first launched Sigma, I remember lots of people thinking, do we need another trade show? Um, but Eman and his team have gone ahead and shown everybody that they could really do a good job and this has grown to becoming one of the leading uh, gaming expos in Europe, probably the leading one in terms of iGaming, I would say. Uh, we have uh, an interesting uh, set of panels and speakers for you today, and the Prime Minister will also be joining us around 10 o'clock to say a few words. Uh, we're going to try and keep it short and brief. You will have seen from the agenda that panels are scheduled mostly for half an hour, some of them for 40 minutes. So the idea is really to be concise and to the point. If there are any questions from the floor, I would also ask you please to keep them concise. Um, before we start, please allow me just to congratulate my colleagues at WH Partners for winning the Law Firm of the Year Award last year at the Malta iGaming Awards. I think it's quite a fitting tribute to the hard work um, and enthusiasm that my colleagues and our team show towards this industry and serving our clients in this industry. So, having said that, I will now leave you to uh, my partner, Olga Finkel, who will be chairing the next panel. And I wish you a very good conference and a good show. Thank you very much. Regulators and operators. Is Malta's gaming law meeting, exceeding or failing to meet expectations? Heathcliff Faruja, MGA. Jesper Karbrink, Mr. Green. Jesper Svensson, Betson. Martin Lichka, GVC. Moderated by Olga Finkel, WH Partners. gentlemen and welcome to the regulators and operators panel hopefully in this very short time that we have today we'll figure out whether it's this this or this for the regulatory regime <laughs> well let's go in and dive in straight away maybe we start from Heathcliff who represents the MGA here the only regulator on the panel maybe you can kick off by uh, giving your perspective on this four months first four months after the implementation of the regulatory regime what keeps you awake at night? What <laughs> has gone wrong? What Hello, has Mr. gone Steve. well? <laughs> <laughs> so, good morning to everyone. Um, uh, Olga, as you said, sort of it's been four months, and uh, <coughs> being very honest, talking about the legal overhaul in the past sort of is already good enough for us. Why? Because it was sort of this huge uh, project. As you are well aware, uh, we worked on it for a number of years. It was sort of, and we had an endless amount of internal meetings, meetings with stakeholders. Um, discussions, tweaks until until we got to the to the actual date, the first August when uh, the new law came into force. And uh, for us, sort of, it was um, a huge achievement, obviously, even for the teams at the MGA because everyone worked hard for this project. And it was sort of, it was like sort of, I don't know, the, the, the first of August was sort of a date which we're sort of dreaming on. Oh, soon the first of August, soon the first of August for the for, for the launch. But then what's uh, <coughs> what's important is that uh, because many many would think that ah yes, so the new law came into force, it's the 1st of August, sort of came into force and we're done, that's it. When in reality, sort of, it's totally not true because then once the new law came into force, obviously a different project uh, kicked off, which is the actual implementation because obviously in the new law, in the new law we included a number of, um, we looked at a number of new areas, we, we introduced a number of uh, new measures, we strengthened the role of the, of the regulator. 
However, then each and every measure we, we, we introduced, obviously, that needs, to be, that needs to be implemented. And the implementation is, uh, is, is no easy task, obviously, because uh, then now we have teams looking at each and every measure, and we have project teams, mini project teams now, implementing all those uh, initiatives we include in the new law. And how do you deal with uh, building the regulatory capacity? Because obviously the new law implements the risk-based approach, which is very different from uh, box-ticking exercises that unfortunately we had before. So the mentality of the regulator for this should be very different. How do you deal with this? How do you train your staff? Ara, Olga, currently, if I'm being very honest, I cannot say that we implemented all the, the measures we include in the, in the law. There are the transitory provisions until the end of the year. However, now we are working uh, on all the initiatives. Case in point, the, ones you, the one you mentioned related to, uh, to the risk-based approach, we call it, uh, for compliance, for example. Even that, per se, now we have the compliance team who are literally looking at the whole database. We have the risk rating of each and every operator, and now we are drafting a compliance plan for each and every operator. So it's, it's no easy task. We haven't finished it yet. However, we started. We obviously started with the riskier operators, because that is why it is a risk-based approach. And we are starting with the, with the compliance plan. But as you said, it's with the same team, with the same people. Yes, we did a lot of training. We gave training even to the operators uh, before the actual law came into force. We had a number of internal, uh, internal meetings and training sessions for the staff as well. However, then, as you said, uh, it is a different mindset. It's a different culture, and it takes time. So it's not that we had a couple of training sessions, and then all of a sudden, everyone changed. Uh, it's, it's a culture change. It would take us uh, a number of months. We are well aware, and we are well aware that once the new law came into force, we needed those six to 12 months until you implement, until you truly start getting the full benefit of those measures you introduced. And we, we are currently in the, first, uh, in the first period, in the first six months of the new law. Right. Let's have a closer look at the new uh, licensing regime which is obviously much more streamlined and uh, straightforward. All this mind-boggling one-to-one -one correspondence between the number of gaming suppliers that the operator has and the number of licenses that the operator had to have is gone for good. Thanks, God, for that. Mm -hmm. Jasper, uh, Jasper, Mr. Green Jasper, we have a technical <laughs> problem here. We have two Jaspers. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think is the commercial impact of this change in the regulatory regime? How easier or how more difficult possibly it is now uh, with your time to market, with flexibility that you have uh, due to regulatory regime with, the, with new products? I, mean, I, I think uh, the, the new regulation is it's more pragmatic and it's also uh, in a sense more future-proof and, and just having the if you look at the corporate structures, but in, in being in a fast-growing phase as we are, um, being in, in different regulatory markets, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, changing the corporate structure happens all the time. And, and with, the, with the new legislation, that has become much more easier. We don't have to apply for a new license. We don't have to go to the regulator to ask whether we could have a daughter company here or here. And I mean, just taking the book, acquisition we did uh, 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 about a year ago. I mean, that became much s smoother. It became much swifter. And we could start implementing the new corporate structure basically day number one, instead of having to wait for, for an approval from, from MJ. That is a business decision. That should not be a regulatory decision. And so, so that's a good thing uh, in, in the new, in the new uh, regulation. Right, so the new regime, in your view, actually respects the operators. Uh, it does not treat them anymore as little kids prescribing everything and asking for approval for absolutely every little detail. No, exactly. And also the risk-based approach means that there will always be a communication between the regulator and the operator because our definition of risk is X. And then we have to make sure that the regulator has the same view as we have. So having a risk-based approach will also mean that it will, be, it will be more pragmatic. It will be able to evolve over time because the risk will change over time. Right. Uh, Jesper, Petson yes. Group, Jesper. Yes. Uh, what is your view of the new uh, licensing structure? And in particular, maybe you can pay a bit more attention and explain your view on uh, the umbrella license. Mm -hmm. uh, when you can have one corporate license and therefore have flexibility in the group, how do you arrange your, your operations? What mm -hmm. is the impact on a, such a large group uh, as Betson? Yeah, I think 
to start with, uh, the, the, new, the new regime is, is simplified, and, and that is a very, very good thing. It's, it's more detailed, but within those details, there is a lot of simplification. And, and for us, then, as well, that have a history of acquisitions, as, as you are mentioning, uh, we, we are a multi-brand multi entity and uh, operate in a range of different jurisdictions, this, this becomes very important for us to have that uh, level of more flexibility, more prag pragmatic, I think that's a very good, good word in this. And I also think throughout the time, there's always been a very good dialogue with, uh, with the regulator here in, in Malta, and that's one of the, the strengths, I, I believe, with the regulation here as uh, well. Though. So, so I, I really want to, to say that we are very pleased to, to see all those things coming in, into place. And I think, all in all, it's a very, very robust um, regulation. It covers all those, all those components, but it gives us now more, more clearance and, and uh, some pragmatism in some parts that were a bit more painful in the past. Right. You mentioned uh, the... the um that there is no need anymore to approve certain things. Now it is a post-factum notification rather than the prior approval for quite a few instances. So on the one hand, it's uh, less work for the MGA. On the other hand, it should be a very happy situation for the operators. Um, my question is to Heathcliff. How do you see uh, this rule affecting your regulator's role uh, supervisory role uh, over the operators. I mean, isn't it the case that uh, because you don't need to approve anything anymore, because the notification can be done post factum, and therefore certain time uh, may pass between you know the act happening or the situation occurring and you noticing it happening, and in case you need to take action, wouldn't that action will be too delayed? Wouldn't that weaken the regulatory regime and your supervisory role? Uh, allow me to start with. I, I, I disagree with your first comment when you said that uh, we need to approve less or have less work. <laughs> Definitely not the case. Because from our end, technically, there was just a slight change at the, initial, uh, at, the, at the initial part of this process. As Jesper said, ultimately, we believe that that is a business decision, not a regulatory decision. So from our end, we did not remove any of the checks we, we do. So let's say there's a change in shareholding structure. We are still conducting all the checks on all the UBOs, the due diligence, the criminal probity checks, and we are still issuing all the approvals we used to issue just before the new law. The only change, which is a very important one, since, as Jesper said, and we totally agree, it is a business decision, whether or not a company is bought out, there is a merger, it's not a regulatory decision, it's a business decision. From our end, we're in a situation as a regulator that we were in between, and you know, even, even uh, in terms of our licensees, we've experienced a couple of multi-million uh, mergers or acquisitions. And many a times we were in between sort of this multi-million deal. So in this multi-million deal, there was sort of the regulator who needed to approve each and every individual or each and every part of this, uh, of this move. And then all this business uh, deal to a certain extent was pending the, other, the, the, the regulator's approval. And then many a times when there are multi-millions involved, sort of you, you, you can't blame those involved especially when there are listed companies. Sometimes there are listed companies and they, they need to go and sort of explain all the new structure to the regulator, when in reality it's not even, it isn't, it isn't even a fait accompli. So it could be that there is the, a scenario where the whole transaction uh, sort of uh, gets, gets cancelled. And then sort of you had all the approvals, everything, but then sort of you went to the regulator and then the business decision was not to proceed with the, with the deal. So the way we're doing it now, for us it's even better because one, we are not in any way being involved in that part where we consider it's the business decision. We are not being involved uh, at that stage. But from our end, we are still conducting all our checks, all our criminal probity checks. <coughs> and as you are surely aware, we can still then uh, even either not block the transaction, but from our end, if we have issues with, uh, with any of the individuals involved, we do not consider them fit and proper, we can always revert back to the previous structure. And we have the power to do that. And then obviously our ultimate power would be that to cancel the license. Mm -hmm. So let's say there is this uh, huge uh, deal, huge takeover, but then at the end we take the license. Obviously it's not something we would want to do, but we have the power, we have the power to do it. And just to clarify as well, so we need to keep in mind that if a licensee is being sort of uh, either bought out or there is a merger, we are talking about licensed entities who are even subject persons now under the 40 MLD. So in no way we are removing any 
of the obligations uh, these operators have. So the obligations are there. So if there is a company A who's merging with company B, both companies are obliged to make sure that the deal is, uh, is transparent, that there are those involved are fit and proper. So it is, there is already the onus on the operators, on those involved. Why? Because they are licensed entities to make sure that everything is in order. So from our end, that's what we, what, we, what we say. These are subject persons. They are doing this deal. Once this deal uh, is over, then they come to the regulator and we have all the power uh, to take the actions we need. We, we give our clearance on the individuals involved, but without sort of being in a situation, at times we are in a situation where we were some, I wouldn't say pressured, but sort of we even felt the need. Ah, let's, uh, we, we need to give this top priority. Why? Because there is this huge deal going on and uh, they are waiting our approval. Why should the regulator be in that situation? Uh, if, if we are talking about criminal probity checks, sometimes it takes two months to, 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 to conduct a criminal probity check just on one person. Sometimes it takes two months because we need to involve our inter uh, international partners. Um, it takes time, it takes time. Criminal probity is a, is a very complex and laborious process. So why do we need to sort of do all this to a certain extent in a hurry just because there is this uh, sort of this, this, this business deal which, uh, which is going on? From our end, you do the deal, then they come to us, this is the, the structure we want. Obviously, they would need to, to, to get our approval, but without having that, that urgency to a certain extent. But it will still be possible, uh, my understanding is, uh, to get approval if the operators want. Yes, because in the, the big operator. deals, in the large deals, as you said, it is very possible required, very often required to have legal certainty before yes, 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 the yes, next yes. step is taken. Definitely. From our end, so we are not saying sort of, the new law doesn't say that it has to be post uh, approval, it's up to the operator. So rather than having the obligation <coughs> as it was in the, in the old law, the obligation was to have a pre-approval. Now there is no need to have a pre-approval. Obviously there needs to be approval, but it can either be a pre-approval depending on the, the operators involved if they want to have a pre-approval, uh, because sometimes it could be that there is a sort of a deal where they say, well, it's safer for us to have a sure. pre-approval and we can do that. Or as, uh, as I just uh, explained, it could be a post approval. Mm -hmm. Let's look into the um, rulemaking powers of the regulator. The new regime leaves a lot of uh, discretion to the regulator. And uh, because it is hierarchically structured, all the details are in the directives of the regulator. So the regulator can make the rules and uh, change the rules on the fly without the need to change the law itself. Uh, Martin, what do you think about this uh, situation when the regulator actually is more and more a rule maker rather than the rule enforcer? First of all, good morning everybody. Thanks for having me. Thanks for the very uplifting walk on music. I think that woke <laughs> us all up. And to, I suppose to answer your question, I, sh I should probably say first that I'm, I'm a big fan of, of the new regulation and at the risk of uh, stating the obvious and uh, following the comments of my fellow panelists, uh, I completely agree with what has been said so far. So what will be key going forward is flexibility and dialogue and the main reason why I'm a fan of the new regulation, although the old one, you know, when you had a license free on four that had a certain glamour to it, but unfortunately, as you said, <laughs> that's, all, that's all gone. But to my mind, yeah, flexibility and, and dialogue, and I'm sure that the, the same rules from also uh, what I've heard from Heathcliff this morning, will apply to the rule-making powers of the regulator, because I can imagine that uh, uh, the MGA will be very keen on consulting with the industry. Ultimately, it, it will be the regulator's decision as always, but uh, given their wealth of experience, um, actually, I'm, I'm uh, very, very certain that uh, they will be able to take the right decision, having listened to, to the industry with a view to uh, hitting the main principles we've just discussed, i.e. flexibility and, and dialogue with a view to accommodating not only the innovations, but also, and again, I might sound like a broken record, but all the recent mergers within the industry, and I would imagine that uh, the f uh, that uh, concentration will, f will carry on further. How does this uh, rulemaking <laughs> approach, uh, flexible approach, um, relate and stack up against the approaches taken by other regulators? All of your companies are um, operating in multiple jurisdictions and have multiple licenses. How do you see the approach of the Maltese regulator comparing to the other regulators? Well, in particular, as regards the risk-based <coughs> risk approach, I'm sure that uh, the Maltese, <coughs> Maltese government has drawn inspiration from the other 
from the other jurisdictions or some of the other jurisdictions where, where the operators are licensed because that approach has been applied there for, 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 some, for some time. And at the same time, it usually, you know, you would, have, uh, you would have the primary law setting out the basic principles, but it will sound like a cliche, but it very much applies in my view to the gambling industry, the devil's always in the details. So in the implementing regulations and the other legislative instruments that are being issued by the regulator. And it goes beyond that because it usually, in, in practical terms, it comes down to the interpretation the regulators take of certain rules that are set out in those regulations. So I think it, it going down that route makes perfect sense from, from my perspective, provided that everybody who's involved, be it the regulators, the operators, and ultimately the customers, act reasonably within that space or within that framework. Right, let's have a look at the new regime's uh, player protection and responsible gaming measures. Uh, the regime introduces new measures to strengthen this area and actually putting the player first and at the center of the regulation. Uh, some new measures include providing more information to the player, uh, having responsible gaming tools not further than one click away and other, and other tools. Jesper, for Betsen, who operates a multi-brand strategy, um, how do you see the uh, recent clarifications that have been issued by the gaming authority with respect to uh, self-exclusion cross-brand? Mm -hmm. And what impact does it have on your operation? Um, I, I think the, it's, it's a very fair approach that we are, that we are, seeing, that we are seeing now. And, uh, and also, of course, everything that strengthens play protection is something I think w we all welcome in many ways and, and to have good clearance around that. That's that's uh, a very positive, but also when, when it comes to the whole multi-brand approach that you see so many operators are actually doing today, I think there is the right approach that if you, as a customer, you sign, uh, sign up on one site, that is a site in itself, and it's being treated like, like that. However, when it comes to everything related to, of course, responsible gambling and AML and so forth, that uh, naturally goes across the the group uh, the, the group that you are coming from and operating within those so 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 that should never um, uh, n never come to to a cost of the the other in that sense but for the other reasons I very much welcome this uh, this clarity and I think it's a very very fair way of uh, of structuring it now great. Um, another, another measure that is introduced is that not only operators have to detect possible uh, addictive behavior of the player, but they have to be proactive and implement more proactive tools in order to detect it before that it actually appears. Uh, Jasper, Mr. Green Jasper. Um, what do you think about this measure? Because from where I sit, it looks like these particular tools may probably force you to block more account that you otherwise would have blocked, therefore negatively uh, impacting the business. Maybe the players that the accounts that you will need to block with these preemptive tools would not really end up to be, um, you know, uh, player addicted at all. How how do you see this measure? <coughs> yeah, but uh, <coughs> uh, to start with, I, I I agree with Jesper in in the case that the, the operators welcome a more stringent protection part of the regulation that's a good thing and, and the, the entire industry is heading in this direction now and, and, and in that sense the industry has changed just the last uh, five years it's a, it's a total different view on responsible gambling which is a good thing and when and when, and when it comes to, to your question um, predicting is is what we should do I mean what we, we have built our green gaming predictive tool and we see that as a seatbelt. You use it as a seatbelt, you put it on in the, se in, the, in the happening of that you are losing control, you are playing too fast. And in that case, we tell you in your face that, dear Jesper, I think you should slow down a, slow down a bit now because you're playing too fast. So we have an algorithm uh, uh, following every gameplay, every minute, every second, and doing this. And blocking, blocking is the last resort. When, when you block someone, it, it has gone too far. So actually having a regulation where the regulator put pressure on the operator to predict a negative behavior is a very positive thing. So, so we are totally uh, uh, in line with the regulator in this. 
and, and it's that, this is not only Mr. Green, this is all operators are using these models today to predict. Then we use them differently. We have turned it into a product, others use them for their RG people, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So, so, but I think this is 100% in line where the industry is heading. This is one, once again, again the proof of the, the new regulation being very pragmatic and, and future proof. There are also plans to, um, to further this protection to the players and to actually introduce a unified self exclusion database yeah. for remote operators. So, not only cross brand within the same operator, the player who self exclude from one brand should be excluded from others, but across all licensees within the country. Martin, wh what is your view on this measure? Isn't that a little bit too far reaching, too drastic, make it uh, operators very difficult to comply with this rule? Well, of course, it, it will have a revenue impact, but again, I believe that the, the, the measure is by no means too drastic and doesn't go too far, because if as an industry we want to, at the very least, contribute to help resolve uh, the gambling addiction issues, then having a centralized database with all self-excluders or other people that may be having gambling addiction issues could certainly help achieve that goal that lately the industry has sort of self-imposed. And as you might know, in terms of practical examples, uh, similar databases exist in other jurisdictions that have regulated this space, such as Denmark or Spain. There have been talk in, in um, other jurisdictions that are in the throes of regulating to introduce something similar. So I do believe that this is a very efficient tool due to its centralized nature that could help achieve the gambling, uh, responsible gambling related goals the industry currently has taken on itself. I, Heathcliff, I, I how is it going with this project? Are we too far away or it's <laughs> just around the corner? Not around the corner that we had to walk half an hour to get to this hole. <laughs> Arolga, if I can add, just um, totally in agreement with the panelists. So we need to keep in mind that the industry, the gaming industry is maturing, it's maturing big time. And now sort of us regulators, we are no longer in a situation whereby when we talk about player protection or we talk about sort of responsible gaming, it's like w we have these operators coming against us. It's totally, totally, totally not the case. Even when we, fa we made our first announcements about the unified self-exclusion, we had operators actually calling us, uh, telling us that they would be ready to help us, telling us that they want to be consulted to make sure that we have a proper, uh, proper system, a proper tool. From our end, in terms of the unified self-exclusion, we are ambitious, but we are, uh, sort of we are aware that it's not an easy project. It's not an easy uh, project to implement. Why? Because we are talking about 300 operators. So we have uh, roughly 300 operators uh, having a motor license. Many of them operate internationally. So it's not like having a system whereby sort of to implement sort of we have a similar system in Malta for the, for the land base, whereby if you go to any casino or any bingo hall, once you self-exclude from one casino, then you cannot have access to any other casino or any bingo hall. But the easy part of that, to a certain extent, is that we use the sort of the, the identification, the Maltese identification, or when, when, when they are foreigners, we have the passports. However, when you are sort of looking at having a system to cater for 300 operators operating internationally, obviously, it's not an easy project. However, we have already met a couple of uh, providers who gave us sort of their view, and there are, there are technical solutions. One thing we are not going to uh, do for sure is to rush through this project. We don't want to sort of rush through this project simply to say that, yes, we have a unified self-exclusion and then uh, sort of its implementation would be disastrous. Why? Because we are very careful about the implementation because of our operators and even for the reputation of the MJ. We don't want to come up with this uh, project saying we have implemented a unified self-exclusion, but then we realize that uh, two, three months uh, down the line we are having issues. Keeping in mind that we have operators, sort of, let's say there is the World Cup. One of the things we discussed, let's say there is a World Cup, because we're even discussing whether or not to have a live system, because we've, we've seen solutions whereby you would have a unified self exclusion, but it would be live. But then what if you have a live system and our system fails before the World Cup? What happens to the operators? What happens when they want to start accepting bets when in reality the system fails? We do not want to be in a situation whereby we are sort of blocking the, the operators from actually conducting their business. So we are discussing these details. Um, from our end, we are committed to issue the first uh, document uh, early next year. Hopefully Q1 of 2019 will issue a document for public consultation and we'll also consult on the technical solutions. Right. Let's look into the new taxation. Unlike the licensing regime that came much simpler than before, taxation seems to be getting much more complex and complicated. 
there is uh, no fixed fees anymore. The tax base is revenue. There are different caps everywhere. There are compliance contribution. There is a 5% tax. How do operators see this change in taxation? How sensitive are you to a high taxation that you will be paying from this year? I, um, when, when we look at the impact for, for us in this, uh, it, it's not change, changing a lot, but I think what, what we conclude with is that I think the new, the new way is a fair way uh, again, and uh, uh, that is also also a positive and it's it's not about uh, you know sometimes you, you pay a bit more you contribute a bit more and and as long as that is being done in a way that i think is is fair and business friendly which uh, which i really find this to be then uh, then it's not something that uh, uh, anyone should really have any concerns with i believe in that sense yes per martin <coughs> I mean, we're paying a bit more tax and it's a bit more complicated, so <laughs> the answer could be it's a bad thing. Uh, but no, I, I, I don't think it is. And, and honestly, we focus on so much other things that, that actually, this might sound a bit stupid uh, or strange, but paying tax, the more tax you pay, the better it is, because then you made some, some higher profits. So, so we have to understand that two things with taxes. First of all, they are a bit like the weather. Whatever they are, that's a bit about my pay grade. So you adapt to them. Mm -hmm. And second of all, they usually go, go to good things. And, and I think the, the government of Malta, as other, all other governments, has some holes to, to fill. So we are contributing to, to the society where we are operating. Mm -hmm. So the taxes are what they are, and, and we adapt to that. And I don't see that as a big issue at all. I, I think we, we're pretty confident. <laughs> and we should also remember that if you're running a, a, a business where you both have an operator business and a provider business, you pay lower taxes on the provider business. So for, for some groups, this actually equals out. It could even be a positive thing. So it's a good thing. It's not a problem. Mm. Martin? I can't agree more that tax is what it is. And of course, as a the GVC group will pay its due contribution to the Maltese authorities, we will do that. I suppose the only practical change is that our tax people need to get used to a new set of tax returns. So I can imagine that for a while they'll be moaning and gro groaning, but we'll take it from there. We'll file the returns, we'll pay the tax. I agree again with my fellow panelists. Great. <coughs> well, we'll soon be running out of time. Are there any questions from the audience? Everything clear? Super clear. <laughs> okay. Then, yeah. uh, well, let's proceed to the closing remarks. So to the operators, I want to show up, <laughs> thumbs down, or so and so, please. Up, up. <laughs> 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 no pressure at all. Uh, I have a pending license. No, yeah. I'm kidding. No, no. Honestly, it's, it's definitely up. I mean, this is the... And yeah. looking at regulations, this is the... This is one of the first gaming regulations coming, like 10, 12 years ago, and, and this is the second version. Of course, it's better than the first one. And, and in an international perspective, I believe it's, 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 it's a really good one as well. So f from Mr. Green's side, it's thumbs up. Excellent. Excellent. It's, it's the same from, from the Betson side, I have to say. And I, I think, once again, uh, Malta and, and MJ have really shown very high competence in this. I mean, we work over... 11 different jurisdictions, and you can really see that um, the regulator very much understand the business. We have had a good, good dialogue throughout the years and so forth, and I, I think this is a very robust uh, new framework, and uh, congratulations on, on putting it uh, together in that sense. So we are happy. Oh, the chief regulator on the panel, I have no <laughs> choice but go, yeah, yeah. It's great. <laughs> no, but all my silly jokes aside, I will once, agree, uh, once again agree with my fellow panelists. Uh, I believe that the previous experience the MG has had with regulating this industry shines through, and it's very clear th that the new regulation is based on very strong foundations. And uh, as a result, it will allow to capture the ever-changing gambling industry along the lines we've discussed, i.e. stepping up further, stepping up responsible gambling efforts, the seemingly never-ending mergers within the industry, and the same goes for innovation. So I do believe that the new regulation will definitely be capable of capturing that, and that's why, yes, absolutely. And 
Uh, Olga, if I might, might sorry, and, and, and there's one, f one more thing, and that's actually how the regulation comes with a set of very clear and good guidance. And I mean, me and Jesper and, and Martin as well are seeing it a different approach in our home country right now and yeah. how that creates confusion and mass. And, and that's one of the things that I really like with this regulation. It, it's not only a set of rules, it's also come with clear guidance that kind of gives us a hint on what direction to go. And these guidance can change over time, fair enough, but it's, it's much easier for us to operate a business having this. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. I'm not supposed to vote, but may I please? Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. Do I need to? Keep <laughs> <laughs> yeah. your concluding yeah. remarks, please. No, it's, uh, it's always, it's always all about. It's always good to hear that uh, positive feedback directly from the from the operators. However, um, uh, without being arrogant, I'm not surprised with this feedback. Why? Because at the MGA, even the employees who are here, we've worked so hard on this uh, on this regulation. We've consulted so many times. We made sure that. All our uh, all our uh, laws were clear. Now, obviously, when implementing such a huge change, such a such a huge change in the legal overhaul, there will always be parts where there, there needs more clarity. However, I believe our approach was always that having an open door. Sort of, we always welcome feedback. We consult many times when we have uh, when we have issues with particular uh, criteria before before we uh, we issue them. We consult not because we are not sure on what we're doing, but having some uh, having measures which are which are there simply uh, simply to be misunderstood, and then you end up not achieving the, the regulatory objective uh, of that specific, specific law. So from our end, we believe a lot in consultation, and I believe that uh, over the years we've shown that as a regulator, we, we believe totally in, uh, in consultation. And we believe that when you consult, this is then the result you get, because there, are, there were no surprises. Why? And we did, not sort of, we did not want the law to be sort of a surprise for anyone, because why should the new law be a surprise to any of the operators? We, we, we're in it together. We obviously have our role to regulate the industry. Operators, uh, obviously, they, they, they are the business owners, but they are also aware that they need to be properly regulated. And operators, especially serious operators, want to be regulated by a proper uh, and reputable regulator. Mm. Thank you so much for a very insightful discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to the world's iGaming village. Ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome to the Honorary Joseph Muscat, Prime Minister of Malta. Good morning and welcome to everyone. Sigma has grown steadily year after year. This reflects both the commitment of the people behind this franchise and the consistent growth of this sector, which nowadays has established itself as a very important driver in our economy. Malta is a center of excellence in this space. The digital gaming sector in 2018 is drastically different from the tech sector of a decade ago, not only in terms of size, but more importantly in terms of skills and diversity of activities. Today it consists not only in gaming platforms or customer support services, but also product development, payment gateways, and other technical services. In the coming years, the iGaming industry will continue to benefit hugely from new initi initiatives and synergies. The new regulatory framework that has been enacted in our national laws earlier this year and which has be just been reviewed will, we believe, simplify the multitude of amendments that have been accumulating over the years in terms of gaming, but most importantly will give the regulator more and better tools in terms of compliance and enforcement. The coming year will also see further efforts to venture into new emerging areas closely related to wide gaming. Blockchain and AI are just two of them. Malta is being a trailblazer in these sectors, and we're certainly being seen as a hub of innovation. Blockchain presents itself as an opportunity not only for our country in terms of investments 
and of course the direct impact in creating further quality jobs, but also enhances the iGaming ecosystem. AI is also an area which we are very keen on. We've set up a task force to explore all the possible avenues, notwithstanding having a healthy discussion on its use. Another area which we look forward to is the video gaming industry. This is an industry with an estimated global turnover of $78.6 billion and growing by over 4% every year with a rapidly evolving business model. The industry covers three areas of activities which are distinct from the iGaming industry, namely eSport events, game production and development, and game publishing. Nevertheless, there is an increasing convergence of the digital gaming, eSport, and iGaming sectors together with synergies with the movie industry. From a strategic point of view, this industry will offer us important synergies with the regulated blockchain environment provided by the Maltese jurisdiction, the latter serving as a unique selling point that is not present in other jurisdictions. The industry presents an opportunity for diversification and contributing to developing Malt as a creative hub in the digital arts. The gaming industry is a prime example of what can be achieved if we as a country are open to business and to new ideas. If there is a sector that highlights Malta's ability to evolve and constantly innovate itself to a changing environment, it is the sector. The iGaming sector and our legislative framework have not only survived changes, but have thrived under these circumstances. 20 years ago, the perception was that this sector would be short-lived and with a high element of risk. Nowadays, iGaming and related services have deep roots in our local socio-economic reality. And we all benefit from this rich, diverse, and multicultural ecosystem. A success story is often accompanied by several paternal claims. This happens to be no different. Although the success can be attributed to various sectors and factors, there is little doubt that the mindset of all those involved played the most important role. For a start, both legislators and operators never took the presence of this, this industry for granted. There was, and this also, a very strong conviction that we need to run faster than the competition to stay ahead. That staying still is not an option. We understand that innovation must be constant and ever-evolving. This sector embodies this competitive spirit as no one else does. It is a sector that looks outwards. It is open to the world. This not only accepts challenges, but thrives on challenges. With further investments, both in terms of people and technology, and with more legislative changes in consultation, we can really take this to the next level. Thank you very much. The government's vision for gaming, staying ahead of the curve. The Honorary Silvio Schembri, Government of Malta. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It is a pleasure and a privilege for me to have this opportunity to address yet another edition of Sigma, a landmark and much anticipated event on the iGaming industry calendar. Generating unparalleled interest and with a consistently growing number of attendees participating year after year, Sigma undoubtedly serves as a valuable platform to showcase the ever flourishing gaming industry, Malta the home of gaming excellence. It is an undisputable fact that Malta has established itself 
as the global leading jurisdiction in this sector. 14 years ago, Malta, as the front runner of the then relatively new gaming revolution, led the charge by creating an innovational framework which regulates remote gaming. By setting up this pioneering regulatory framework, which provides legal certainty and an optimal environment for operators to function in this space, this sector has grown and thrived beyond compare, becoming one of the main contributors to Malta's economic growth. Over the years, that very first regulatory framework has evolved to better accommodate the industry's needs. To that effect, earlier this year, a new Gaming Act came into being, an act which aims at eliminating bureaucratic procedures for operators by means of reducing the number of licenses to just two, whilst at the same time strengthening the work of the regulator by conferring a higher level of supervision, monitoring, and scrutiny. Efficiently, effectively, this means that the regulator is in a better position to tackle challenges within the industry as they arise by detecting and mitigating money laundering cases, fraud, and criminal activities. This further provides the ideal backdrop for operators and yields even more prestige for the acquisition of the Maltese license. Innovation is at the heart of our philosophy, and we believe that embracing new technology is key in view of the fast-paced digital revolution. Our country has been at the forefront to conform, adopt and adapt to disruptive technology. In fact, becoming the world's first jurisdiction to provide a holistic regulatory framework for operators to operate in the DLT sphere. This dynamic spirit and can-do approach is what generates, generates excitement within our strong ecosystem, particularly now that we have witnessed the fusion of blockchain and the gaming industry. To this regard, we adopted a proactive stance and we are proud to be the first world regulator to, to launch a regulatory framework sandbox environment for cryptocurrencies, essentially responding to new emerging technologies and, forms and new forms of gaming. I'm in fact informed that new applications in this regard will start as early as January of 2019. Our strong IT infrastructure, robust regulator and can-do attitude allows us to explore new economic niches in this sector. As the Prime Minister mentioned, in fact, video gaming and esports are next on our agenda. In the coming months, in fact, a suitable strategy to cater for this sector will be launched. We are intrigued by the enthusiasm shown towards this field in particular by younger generations who are further igniting a passion for this phenomenon. In much the same way, we have firmly put Malta at the epicenter of the gaming industry. Our country can also serve as a main hub for esports tournaments and for companies in this sector to set up shop here. I'm also aware of companies whose presence in Malta has consequently triggered interest from other esports companies. To this effect, a collaboration between my secretariat and Gaming Malta intends to come up with a strategy which will not only support and help the industry to flourish further, but will also distinguish and support and develop local talent to a professional level, as well as cater for new job opportunities in the digital art sector and attract important esports tourism. Our ambition and vision inevitably requires a skilled, skilled workforce, and we are more than aware of the relevant expertise that is fundamental to the success of the well-being of this industry. A clear picture of where certain skills are lacking has emerged through the recent survey carried out by the Malta Gaming Authority, a survey which put under the spotlight the existing skills within the industry, where these are found to be inadequate and above all has set the wheels in motion to ameliorate the current scenario. In fact, a total of 780 unfilled positions has been reported by the remote gaming companies at the end of last year. This unmet demand 
could be addressed effectively through a conjoint effort between the government and operators. As reflected in the report, operators are taking commendable initiatives to reduce this skill shortage, with the majority of firms, in fact, consistently organizing valuable in-house training. As a government, we are also doing our part. By setting up the European Gaming Institute of Malta, which is a collaboration between MCAST and the Malta Gaming Authority, only a year into its launch, the eGIM has got more than 46 students pursuing studies which pertain to the gaming industry. eGIM is serving as a platform to increase and identify talent, and more importantly, create long-term careers in this thriving sector. Evidently, Malta remains the natural and ultimate choice for operators in this sector. Our holistic and vibrant ecosystem, home to circa 300 gaming companies, puts us at the heart of the iGaming industry. As you might have noticed, our ambition is much, much more bigger than our size. What makes the Maltese jurisdiction unique is its forward-looking approach, one of the very first to recognize the potential of this sector, which has led us here. Today, proudly leading the charge in advocating the development and recognition of new technologies. I thank everyone here for putting your trust in Malta and for choosing it as your home. Lastly, and certainly not the least, I would like to thank Amman Police for his tremendous effort in organizing this much-awaited event that brings under one roof the beating heart of the gaming sector and for his work in showcasing how Malta is way ahead of its peers by not shying away in taking the first leap forward. As a government, we are without exception always available to listen to your suggestion, projects and concerns. Let's continue working together in further future proofing this industry and further elevating Malta as the home of gaming excellence. Thank you and I wish you another successful event. The next paradigm of innovation. How is regulation embracing new technologies? AI, AR, VR, blockchain, products, tools and opportunities. Angelo Dalli, 111 Holdings. Alexander Tomic, Affiliate Republic. Carl Brinkat, MGA. Alexandra Fetisova, Dow Casino. Simon Planza, Planza Law. Moderated by Joseph F. Borge, WH Partners. So, good morning, gentlemen and ladies. Um, this is a topic at heart. Uh, for me, so uh, I'm all about innovation, and uh, actually I'd like to start by introducing my esteemed um, uh, panelists here, uh, most of which I have been knowing for many years now. So I'd like to start with you, Angelo, if you can give a very brief introduction of yourself. Yes, hi, I'm Angelo Dalli. I've been uh, an entrepreneur for many years, set up uh, different companies, exited from them also successfully in gaming, and now I'm focusing on artificial intelligence and specifically how AI and blockchain and also gaming tie up together. And uh, this is something quite exciting, you know, to see the industry evolve over the time. Alexander? Hi, guys. Uh, my name is Alexander Tomic. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Alea. Uh, we've built the first virtual reality casino three years ago, Slots Minion. And uh, if you wonder where you've seen me, I'm the half of the face on the Sigma cover. Carl? Hi, good, good morning, everyone. I'm Carl Brinkat. I'm part of the legal team at the MGA. Um, part of our job is both legal, international affairs, as well as policy. So given the MGA's initiatives on innovative technologies, that's also something I'm involved in, obviously. Yeah, hello, my name is Alexandra, and uh, now I'm the project manager at Dow Casino. 
Uh, Dow Casino is blockchain protocol for uh, gambling industry, and we're providing the software to build decentralized games. So I'm here, and we're working on our project for over two years, and here to present something and uh, making the hackathon as well. Hi, good morning. Sun Planter, partner of a gaming law firm and advising many uh, gaming companies and technology companies on this island, and good to be back in Malta. Good, so we're good to go. Uh, Angelo, um, how is AI already changing the gaming industry as we know it? And what should we expect uh, in, in the future? Yes, I mean, artificial intelligence is changing a lot. It's disrupting many industries, and the gaming industry is one of them. Um, I was happy that I was one of the first to produce an artificial intelligence platform uh, many, many years ago in, in the gaming industry, which led the way also for adoption of a lot of different AI um, that you see that is commonplace. I think that AI will uh, disrupt the industry, for example, in areas where it, we're relating to player behavior, where you try to predict and also manage player behavior in a responsible way giving bonuses at the right time, making sure that you follow the right budgets, making sure that you put personalization. We've already you know, have this technology, but I think AI is going to take it to the next level. Also, when it comes to responsible gaming, spotting the behaviors that may not be so desirable in players, making sure that the players have a safe, fun experience, and making sure there is someone giving you effectively a VIP level of service, even when you wouldn't be able to afford such a service if you had people doing it. Um, regarding the future, I think that, the, that in the future we're going to see AI pervade every kind of experience. You're going to see better recommendations, better game experiences. I also think that the marriage of esports and gaming, I think, is going to be the next frontier that AI is going to enable. I think we're going to see a lot of interesting stuff in that space with hybrid models um, of traditional gaming um, and uh, also gambling together, mixed together with AI, enabling it. Any comments from the rest of the panel about AI? Uh, I'd like to say something. We've seen, uh, actually, I think it's Omni Casino. Uh, I don't know personally the guys that are behind, but uh, uh, the, the, the pitch they come with is about AI or machine learning, especially in terms of compliance and, uh, and in terms of experience they're giving to the players. <coughs> And uh, uh, you see this speech coming back again and again. And uh, when we go into conferences, we meet people uh, that are now starting to aggregate themselves <coughs> around groups that wants to provide artificial intelligence to the, the gaming industry. And the two main things are uh, a recommendation engine, of course, and uh, live segmentation. Uh, and when we talk about live segmentation, we can see bonus abusers, we can see VIPs, and of course, we can see players that may have uh, problems of gambling addiction. So it, it's, it's a very interesting field uh, that, that we're seeing now. We're a little bit late there when we look at industries like uh, Netflix, for example, Spotify. They've done that for years. But what are we getting there? It's, it's interesting to see that. Interesting. Alexander, um, so augmented reality and virtual reality were the next big thing a few years ago. Um, they, did they live up to the, to the expectation? Um, and do you think there's still um, uh, opportunity for AI and, uh, sorry, for uh, VR and AR to, um, uh, to, to, to actually have a, a say in gaming, to have a punch in, in the gaming industry? Well, definitely, you remember three years ago, two years ago, uh, VR was a big thing. Uh, everybody was talking about uh, myself being quite vocal about it, and uh, uh, it, it, it obviously didn't meet the expectation for, for several reasons. Technology is complicated, uh, and there's another reason that's specific to our industry is that if we want to reach the players that does the headset, we need to go to the gaming stores. So it's Steam, for example, or Oculus Store, and we will never get there. We'll never get there because uh, uh, the players that are behind, the, the young people, and uh, uh, the owners of this platform won't let real money gaming application go there, which I believe is a good thing, actually. <coughs> so th there's, a, th there's a real conflict between real money gaming and virtual reality. Now, on the other side, could we do an application uh, in social gaming? Why not? 
we we actually shifting our application uh, to make it a, 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 a social gaming application. Uh, and we're seeing actually, uh, I don't know if you've noticed that Pokestar released uh, the application in virtual reality two weeks ago. Uh, so basically we're looking at what they do, if it's going to pick up or not. But uh, I see a, a, a lot of uh, complications to get a real money gaming application into VR. But specifically on VR, do you think that the main issue was is the fact that you actually need to uh, to purchase external gear? Yes, can you repeat the question? That you have to purchase external gear? Yeah, no, okay, that's the issue. And for anybody that has tried VR here, yeah, except the, the mobile VR, you, you, you need an engineer to connect uh, your headset to, to the computer. First of all, you need a computer that's a powerhouse, and you really need someone who knows who, how to do it and connect it. That That's actually one of the main problem in VR is you need someone that knows how to make it work. Okay, any comments from the panel? Okay, so from Alexandra, we go to Alexandra. Um, and uh, okay, so AR and VR were the next big thing a few years ago, but certainly blockchain is the next big thing right now. And uh, who better than Alexandra could tell us about this? So why is there so much hype about blockchain and how can it disrupt uh, gaming? Uh, you see, uh, you're talking about disrupting, but uh, people who are really involved in the blockchain technology, not just in payments or cryptocurrencies, uh, they, no, they don't talk about the uh, like disrupting. It's another opportunity or it's just uh, uh, problem solving. So blockchain can, can solve some problem or give you another opportunity. What we are like doing in our project, we are trying to create another industry. So it's decentralized industry and we want to, we want to give people an opportunity to attend the gaming industry. We want to change their mind. We want to give the opportunity to every game developer to create their own decentralized game without being connected with anyone. We want, we want the, the blockchain gives the opportunity to give the, to to play such games any, any it, 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 in any points of the world in any in any in any places. So blockchain just create the new market, create the new decentralized market, but it's not disrupting at, at, at all. Why people talking about disrupting? Just because they are really scary, because they don't understand the technology. Uh, and I'm here to teach and to, 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 to teach why the technology can help and why the te technology can, can uh, the, blo the blockchain can open the new opportunities, not just about disruptions. When we say disruptive, it's in the positive sense of yeah. it, that it will make fundamental changes to how the industry works. So w can we explain to, 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 to the people uh, um, in front of us today what are the main advantages that blockchain brings to uh, online gaming mainly? Yeah, for, first of all, it's, it automizes everything. So uh, you, you don't need to care about the processing stuff. You, using the smart contracts, everything goes, goes automatically and you don't need to use third parties. So we're, we're building the protocol uh, which distribute all fees inside of the system automatically. We, uh, the, the another opportunity is the, regula the, the, the regulatory problem. So blockchain, uh, the, 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 the all, um, all transactions inside of the uh, system when players games are regulated by technology. So everyone can check. It's, it's really open, open source. So that's why uh, you, it, it's another opportunity. Uh, and, uh, and next opportunity is the getting fees to invest in the games. So uh, if you want, you, if, for example, if you are creating your own game and you don't have any fees to uh, create the house age, you can put your game to the system, to the blockchain system, and, uh, and you give an opportunity to everyone to invest your game and to get the fees as well. And, and when, when it, it will be released, everything will be distributed automatically as well. Mm. So basically, in a nutshell, the main advantages could be listed as more efficiency for the operator, um, more transparency, I believe, for the operator, for the regulator, and also for the users, 
and uh, possibly also more security from a wider sense. Yeah, because yeah they don't need to keep the funds of the players because exactly. the players is po totally, uh, for or, or the, 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 the wallets is totally on the side of the players. They, do, they don't need to care about the security. Angelo, AI and, uh, and uh, blockchain have a huge potential coupled together. What's your... Uh, yes, I think that uh, AI and blockchain, I think AI will enhance the blockchain offerings. I think it will make it more intelligent. It will also make people... I mean, when we talk about the blockchain, and of course, most of you are interested also in the regulatory aspect. I mean, blockchain is going to create a lot of auditable, transparent data. So you're going to be able to check the logs, make sure you know the transactions are done in a proper way, that they are compliant. But of course, it's going to generate a lot of information, maybe more than currently is available to regulators. So I think AI will be needed to help navigate this mass of data, to help operators understand the patterns, make sense of it, and of course, make sure that it is done in a socially responsible way. Um, and uh, I'm lucky to be on the new task force also of the AI regulation. And, uh, you know, this is something that we will be thinking about on how to make sure that the AI regulation also fits with the blockchain, fits with gaming, and, you know, make sure that the puzzle fits right. Any other comments? Okay, so Carl, now is your moment. So blockchain, AI, augmented reality, virtual reality, uh, and all these innovative technologies. How can a regulator cope with all of this innovation uh, in this space? Not and uh, how does the MGA manage? Well, not easily, um, but I think it emerged very clearly from the panel we had this morning where, was, where there was our CEO, Heathcliff. It, the fact that we involve the industry is a very fundamental part of it. So, I mean, the ethos both of the MGA and of the, the country as a whole is to embrace innovation. And the way we do it, I, I'd like to, I like to see it as, as threefold. First of all, we involve the industry in, in the steps that we take. So if we're going to make amendments to laws, if we're going to allow the use of a certain technology, but we still need to get to grips with how it can affect our regulatory objectives, we involve the industry because the expertise is there. That is one thing, and that is a very fundamental thing. Another thing is the way we, we look at it. We look at technology as an, as an enabler. We, we, so you go to blockchain because, for example, you want, to, uh, you want players to trust more in the fact that they are going to get their money. So you implement smart contracts so that they don't need to rely on the operator because maybe you haven't had the time to build that trust with the player yet. You want to create a more immersive experience, so you, 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 um, you try something in VR. You want to automate and facilitate certain processes and certain processing of data. So you go to artificial intelligence. It's an enabler. So the way we look at it, we, we try and, and shift away from, from the detail of it and from the detail of technology. And, and the starting point is, how is the use of this technology going to affect the operator's ability to adhere to its obligations? How is it going to, well, what are the risks involved? And that is why we have frameworks like the Sandbox Environment, which we launched for, for VFAs and DLT, for example. But also, how can it help? So it's, 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 very, it's usually very much a, a two-sided coin. And then there's the attitude part of it, which I would like to believe, but obviously I'm biased in this. Um, I would like to believe that we have the right attitude and that we, we take an interest in the technology, even the, the, the people within the MGA, they're all, they're all very interested in, in, in technologies and in developments. And I think that attitude also helps us when we speak to the industry and when, when we, we learn from the industry and we teach the industry what we expect from it. Um, it's, it's very much a two-way street, and that attitude, I think, helps it along. Well, obviously, a, regula a regulatory framework does not only involve legislation, but it also involves the processes, the policies, and the, the attitude of the regulator. Um, but, uh, and I think it's extremely important to understand the technology in order to be able to advise on it or to be able to regulate it, as, in, as it is in your case. Um, but are, is the MGA looking at these technologies, particularly blockchain and AI, as something that could be extremely beneficial in its role as a regulator as well? Absolutely, yes. Um, first of all, the fact that, that the law enables us to look at these things is also a benefit, obviously. So the fact that it is relatively technology neutral from the operator's side is a benefit as well. 
but for us, yes, absolutely. So if you look at what, one of, what is one of our major concerns as a regulator to ensure that this is not prejudiced, it is the players getting their money when it is due. So if we look at smart contracts, if we look at the transparency and auditability of blockchain transactions, this is something that can help. If we look at the data that we ask, well, that we ask operators to submit to us um, in order for us to, for example, implement our risk-based approach, artificial intelligence can help us make sense of that data in, a, in an easier way. So this is something that, yes, I, I mean, our primary focus as a regulator is to ensure that the industry is run well, but ensuring that we are in a position to do so that also means looking at technologies for our own use as well, yes, definitely. Okay, so Simon, Simon, um, we know that the Maltese regulator has always been at the forefront of innovation, uh, always at the forefront of trying to uh, be more friendly towards new business models, new uh, technologies, but it's not the case everywhere. Um, how are other regulators adapting to these changes in technology and business models as well? I'm happy to reconfirm what you say. Uh, the MGA has been at the forefront and I suspect that this will be even more the case in the future under the new regulatory regime, not least because the, MGA uh, the powers of the MGAs have been strength uh, strengthened. Uh, that leads me to the first comment that often the problem is not always with the regulator himself but uh, it may also be at the government level or legislative level, not giving enough breath uh, to, to breathe uh, for the regulator. So usually regulators struggle with innovation and I, from my experience I see a couple of factors why this is the case and if you permit I, I will outline three of them. Uh, one is expertise. Uh, of course it would help if you had in-house with the regulator uh, technology expertise. So, um, of course, one of my recommendations would be to get some people in-house who really have the expertise in these fields. Uh, if you don't have, uh, then there's another way of doing it, or an additional way, and the MGA has done that very well with the industry, which is uh, reaching out to the industry in an active dialogue, uh, inviting submissions. Um, so I would say that's the first point, expertise. The second point is the question, are you trying to regulate each specific new technology or do you try to pursue a holistic, comprehensive public policy? Uh, why do I say that? If you try to attempt each time to regulate a new technology, you will always lag behind. Uh, whereas if you have a comprehensive, sound public policy, uh, you don't have to reinvent the wheel uh, for each new technology. Uh, I can give an example, AML. Uh, there are good practices, uh, sound practices in place. There are public policy principles in place. Um, there is the risk-based approach. There are methods in how to assess the risks when it comes to money laundering. And of course, when you have that and you have confidence in that system, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, so I think these are a couple of factors that seem uh, very important. And maybe a third aspect uh, would then be uh, the time factor. Imagine if you have each time to address a new technology and engage in a whole process of legislation, public consultation with, let's say, the regions and all the political uh, players there are in place, it will take forever. So by the time the legislation is out, uh, it's already outdated. You spoke about expertise, but haven't we all learned on our own, doing a lot of self-learning, and Carl is one of them. I, I, I'm pretty sure you didn't uh, follow any university course about blockchain and innovative technologies, but I'm pretty sure you did a lot of self-learning. So, uh, isn't it back to the attitude? Pardon me? Is it isn't it back to the attitude of the regulator? Yeah, the attitude of having the willingness to uh, uh, onboard uh, such persons, either in-house or, or as an advisor, close advisor. Um, it doesn't necessarily always have to be, in this case, somebody from blockchain, just a technology-minded, innovation-minded person that comes from <coughs> 
uh, those fields. Um, that would already suffice. But the regulator is not the only problem. Actually, the major problem is the legislation most of the times, right? So, and again, in Malta, we always uh, try to draft legislation in a way that it is as technology neutral as possible, even creating tiers of legislation by having the framework law in the main act, then having some more details in the regulations, but the real meat of the regulation is generally in directives, uh, guidelines, policies, and, and these tools. Um, is that uh, um, the trick of uh, making a successful uh, future-proof, let's say, uh, regulation? Absolutely, you touch on a very critical point, because uh, what often goes wrong when uh, regulating such aspects is that the legislator tries to pack too many things in the primary law. And what you then have is you have an inflexible law that is not technology neutral, for instance, or not uh, adapt, able to adapt to new technologies. And imagine, depending on the country, how long it can take to change primary law. It can take many, many years. Um, so the first step is to move things from primary law uh, to secondary law and have primary law focus on public policy goals and the instruments how to achieve those goals. Um, Similar statement could be said at the level between secondary law and the powers of the regulator. So again, too many things often addressed in secondary law instead of giving discretion uh, to the regulator to address these uh, issues. In some countries it's better than in others. Um, Denmark, for instance, uh, it's rather light to adopt, uh, adapt the secondary law. In other countries it's very difficult again and it can take uh, many years okay any other comments from the panelists well in our case we have the benefit of having uh, having enjoyed and continuing to enjoy the the trust of the legislator so we, uh, speaking from the mga side we are given the flexibility um to to delve into the detail ourselves there is also another thing which is which i think is very important and when it comes to to matters like it's it's particularly important in this case when it comes to to dlt and, and tokenization of the LT assets. Um, it, the, the fact that the national stakeholders which are involved also communicate with each other is something which I feel is very important and something which in Malta perhaps also aided um, by, by, our, by the fact that we're so small, it's something that we do have. So if you take, if you take DLT and VFAs, we've been in constant contact with the MDIA, with the MFSA, and creating a holistic framework, not just from the gaming regulation side, but uh, more generally, uh, as, a, as a jurisdiction creating a holistic framework, I think it's important uh, both for legal certainty uh, as well as uh, in order to enable business to, to function in a regulated way, but in a way which embraces innovation and, and can actually move forward as a business. Just to clarify for our audience that it not, is not so much savvy about the new blockchain uh, Regula regulatory framework. When we talk of VFAs, we're talking about cryptocurrencies. So. Yes. And, and the MDIA is the Malta Digital Innovation Authority, which is the regulator that has been set up to look at the technology itself. Angelo, you have seen quite a lot of different businesses in your life. Um, uh, and Malta has always been your main uh, uh, jurisdiction. Um, but I'm pretty sure that you have uh, seen and made comparative analysis of quite a few different um, uh, jurisdictions. What gives Malta the edge and um, why do you think that many other regulators are not catching up? Uh, I think one of the things that gives Malta the edge is that operators are not here for the Maltese market itself per se, but actually they want to be regulated by the Malta Gaming Authority. I think that actually gives an edge, um, especially because the laws are modern, they have been updated, they have actually taken on the concerns of the industry uh, on board, um, and I do think that this nimbleness does give Malta an edge. Um, and the fact that operators have self-selected Malta to be regulated, I think that in itself shows, you know, the, the gives one of the main edges. I think the accessibility of people, the feedback, I think the process in which you can appeal and discuss things, I think that is also the flexibility yet with a good 
strict framework that actually regulates, that makes sure you know, that there are no bad actors. I think this is all you know, coming to great. And also, the innovation, that the innovation trust that there is in Malta right now is literally unprecedented almost anywhere. I mean, you don't find countries that you know, are doing blockchain, doing AI regulation, doing all the stuff all the time at the same time. So I think we're really at the forefront. And in fact, this is something that I think the role of regulators and the regulated, and especially the lawyers in the audience also, I think it's going to change um, the way that things are done. Because if you have tools that can actually ensure compliance in a better way, that can cut down on the amount of uh, manual labor, I, I think this is going to change the way you know, things are done in, in the future. So it's quite exciting to see it play. We have just a few seconds left. Are there any questions from the floor? No, so uh, any final comments from the panelists? So we can close it here. Thank you very much. I hope you have a great day at Sigma today, and particularly in our regulatory conference. And I'll see you around, around the stalls. Thank you very much. Hello everybody, it's that time of the conference <coughs> where somebody comes up to me and says we need a filler. <laughs> In other words, I need to come up here and say a few words because not everybody's mic'd yet, but they will be mic'd very soon. Um, so we had this morning um, the panel on Maltese regulation and how the new gaming act is going, the views of the operators. Um, we, we then had a very uh, interesting intervention by the Prime Minister and also by the junior minister responsible for gambling. And this panel now led by, by Joe Borch, which I hope you all found interesting. Um, coming up next is a panel on consumer protection in the gambling industry, which is becoming more and more relevant. And as you know, a number of regulators probably uh, I suppose the, the UK Gambling Commission is at the forefront of this, of becoming more and more strict in the application and enforcement of the laws, but also if you see things like the advertising ban in Italy and all of that, which are things that will be addressed on this next panel. Um, please, if you do have any questions to the panel, do raise your hand and ask them when the moderator asks for questions and try to keep them concise. I hope you're enjoying the conference, and once again, Enjoy the show. International perspective towards more emphasis on consumer protection and responsible gambling. Chris Elliott, Wigan. Quirino Mancini, Tonucci and Partners. Santiago Asensi, Asensi Abogados. Yannicka Sunt. NGA Moderated by Morton Ronde Nordic Gambling So welcome everybody for a great panel uh, another great panel I hope uh, which is, uh, this time it's about in international consumer protection. And everyone who's involved in gambling will have seen how there's a wave of concern over gambling issues 
uh, sweeping across uh, Europe. I think it started in uh, the UK, perhaps, but it reached many countries. It reached my own country, Denmark, uh, in Sweden. And I know it reached uh, Italy with full effect. And I'm sure it, uh, that we will hear more about uh, Spain and Malta. Uh, so we don't have much time, and I really want to get into, into the depth of this. Uh, so, Yannicka, can you tell us uh, what steps the, uh, the Maltese government have taken to ramp up on consumer protection issues? Sure, thank you. Um, so it's obviously, as everybody knows, um, there was a new law uh, enacted in Malta earlier this year, and one of the main focus of, of this law was actually consumer protection. And what this law has done has actually written and put down black on white a lot of things that many operators were already doing. As, um, as our CEO Heathcliff Faruja said earlier today, the industry has matured to an extent that they do not always need to wait for regulation in order to do something, because it's no secret that obviously technology will always, will always precede regulation, and if the industry were to wait for regulation in order to do something, then it, obviously we wouldn't be here otherwise. Um, so what this, what this law has done is actually put a lot of these um, practices in writing and has made them enforceable. Um, and the, the idea behind all this is actually to empower the consumer in his, in his activities and to let him be in control of his activities. And that is always the idea behind it. We want to keep um, gaming and gambling an entertainment industry. But obviously, the, the pitfalls of addiction are no secret. And the idea behind this is to ensure that the consumer remains in power. We've also um, revamped the advertising um, reg regulation. And this goes hand in hand with player protection. And the idea behind this is to actually make sure that the players and anyone who wants to gamble and who wants to engage in gaming activity knows exactly where to go in order to do this in, a, in the regulated environment. So it's an element of channelization. And that is why it's actually so important to regulate advertising properly and to ensure that it is, it is safe and not attractive to minors and to vulnerable people. But at the same time, it is there so that people can know where they can play if they want to play in a regulated and safe environment that will protect them from, from falling into the pitfalls of addiction. What has the industry's response been to, to um, these uh, new the, initiatives? The industry has been in the loop on, on our, all our initiatives from day one. And it's not only the industry. We've, um, we really advocate consultation. And we do this because the truth is that <coughs> no one knows better than the, the industry since they are on the ground. So what we know is from what we have learned from a regulatory perspective, but they know what it's like to be in the business. The players know what it's like to play. And so by opening up the consultation to all the stakeholders um, in the industry, that's when you can come up with a, a, a product that's, that you can actually enforce and, and work on. However, um, like in all instances, when there's something new, there have been teething problems and then there are regulations and provisions that are harder to, to, to actually enforce. And, um, and because of this, we've actually already started working on um, making sure that what there already is, is actually going to remain so. So we're, we're working on revising them. We've um, once more, on a, for a second time, engaged researchers to actually look into them and seeing how effective all our provisions are being. And we're, we're hoping to come up with a revised, um, a revised version soon, but we're always open to receiving more feedback. And this, of course, can be difficult for you to say anything about, but we've seen in many countries that this just seemed to be the first steps that are taken. Do you see that it's possible that the politicians would want to enforce even stricter regulations uh, sometime in the near future? The, the truth is that this depends on the manner in which the, the industry and the businesses receive our, our legislation, our regulation. If they really continue maturing and work on what, we're, on, on what there is with a responsible approach, then that shouldn't be the case if, it, if they can stick to the objectives. But we will always seek to attain our regulatory objectives. And if attaining our, regular, our regulatory objectives means we have to enforce stricter provisions, then that will be the case. But I think it would have to depend on the manner in which the industry will, will take on these provisions. OK, thank you. Thank you. Chris, you would, if anyone know how 
the regulation seems to evolve, uh, not necessarily to the better uh, over time. So I don't think, if you, look, if you look two or three years back, you would probably not have seen all of these uh, <coughs> restrictions coming in. Uh, and can you give us an, sort of an update on where we are now and what you, what you see is, is there in the horizon for, for the UK? Yeah, so in, well, any observer of the UK market will know that the regulator has been through a period for the last 18 to 24 months of really ramping up its enforcement efforts to try to drive compliance standards, really driven by a, a, a real concern both by the regulator and the public at large around uh, consumer protection issues not being taken seriously enough by the industry. Um, but what kind of happened in the UK was in 2014 when it moved to point of consumption, there was a whole long list of license holders that uh, came and got their license, but there was this kind of knowledge or, com or gap in the market about actually understanding what it means to be compliant with regulation, which was actually in place at the time. So what we've seen is a, a lot of licensees coming in and the regulator then looking to elevate compliance standards when it's come to realize that actually there is this gap between what the regulation says and what operators are actually doing to comply with that regulation. So hence we've seen this real drive, both with Sarah Harrison coming in and, and now Neil MacArthur, towards using enforcement as a tool to driving up compliance standards. So really the concerns continue to be uh, really around both AML on one, on the one side, but importantly for the context of this panel, um, social responsibility is, as, is the, the drum that keeps on being uh, beaten in the UK. It's really, uh, if you listened or anyone read the Neil MacArthur's speech the other day, that one of the two issues three issues. One is advertising, which we'll come on to, but two, two issues are operators are and have been for a while now under an obligation to have processes in place to identify when their customers, this is online, have are exhibiting signs of having a problem with their gambling. And so what we're seeing is a real move towards operators taking that responsibility seriously, investing in systems to identify the types of behaviors that look towards someone developing a problem on the one side, so identifying the problem. On the other side is the, okay, what, we, what do you do with that information? It's about what we, what we call interacting with customers and understanding the impact that that has on that customer in staving off problems before they manifest into, into real problems. So those two areas we continue to see particular focus on and we will, we will continue to see, um, see that being a focus of the regulator in the coming months. Uh, if you think about it, all, all of that stems around, really, in the, in the online sector, knowing who your customer is. I mean, we hear that phrase all the time, but it's about making use of the information which is available to you as, a, as an operator to then inform the process you've got in place to try and stop problems before they actually happen. So I, I will expect to see enforcement being a continuing theme in the UK, particularly with a focus on those two, those two issues. Um, and I don't, I don't see any, <laughs> any sign of it stopping anytime soon. If I was an operator looking to enter the UK and I saw the fines that have been issued recently, I think I would take a step back and say, hold on, uh, is, this, uh, is this a viable business for me? Uh, what would you advise your, your clients that are now looking for, uh, for a license in the UK? I guess if you're in UK now, you just have to comply, but, but for a new client, for some of them, it seems that they, they, they may need to change their business uh, quite dramatically. So it's, it's a conversation that we have to have regularly with clients who are approaching, uh, operating in a regulated market for the first time, say. They're often new businesses that are w wishing to understand what it means to run a business in a heavily regulated environment, as is the case in the UK. The simple fact is, compliance does cost, and I think whilst the regulator might have been prepared to tolerate uh, businesses which had maybe policies and procedures that look good on paper, I think it's now much more alive to the issue of, uh, if you scratch a bit deeper beneath what those policy policies actually say, sometimes that doesn't go very deep. You don't have to go very deep to realize that actually the compliance function is not as it, as it should be. So the conversation has to be had early that you need to invest in compliance if you want to operate without the risk of enforcement hanging over you. Santiago, in Spain, we've seen recent uh, amendments to the law that was actually favorable to the industry. We had a tax reduction uh, and the uh, window for, uh, for licensing uh, opened. 
so now uh, I assume a lot of new operators are getting in. And uh, are they looking forward to, uh, to restrictions, for example, on, uh, on, on marketing? Yes, uh, let's see. Uh, we have uh, the, the window in order to file applications until the 17th of December. Uh, it's been, the window has been open for a year, but it seems that everyone has waited uh, till the last month. Uh, and of course, uh, marketing restrictions and, uh, and the wave of the tsunami coming from, from Italy is, is also affecting Spain. Uh, right now, uh, a gaming advertising in Spain is a big question mark about what's going to happen. Uh, around a month ago, uh, it was published uh, by the government together with the populist party Podemos. Uh, the guidelines of what will be the next, the, sorry, the next state uh, general budget act for 2019, where it comes with a provision that says that uh, gambling advertising should be regulated as tobacco products. Uh, in practical terms, that would mean uh, a full ban on gambling, except uh, advertising done between professionals of the industry or places where you buy cigarettes. Uh, due to the big uh, red alarm that this caused, uh, uh, the Minister of Finance, a uh, few days after, had to clarify that uh, there will be restrictions applicable to, to, to gambling product, to, sorry, to, to uh, gambling advertising, but uh, it will not be a full ban. So there will still be some opportunities uh, to advertise and so on. The thing is that what is next? I mean, well, we need to wait and see what happens because this is all the information that we have got now. But uh, things are going to depend uh, in the first place of the political scenario. Uh, we might go uh, with the, the instability, uh, political instability that we have uh, in Spain right now. Uh, we might go to general elections in three, six months, uh, something like that. Uh, in which case, everything, uh, any initiative uh, in legislation will be frozen. Uh, we need to take into account that this is not uh, uh, only the first attempt in order to regulate gambling advertising. Uh, the first bill on gambling advertising was uh, published uh, on uh, 2015. And again, due to political reasons, uh, which was the fact that Spain uh, spent almost one year without a government, uh, that was <laughs> probably the best uh, year in Spain in the recent history. Uh, the dec that decree was not approved. Uh, a second version of that decree uh, was published in 2017. But again, there was a turn in the government, and we have the current uh, socialist and populist uh, government uh, in Spain. So we don't know uh, what's going to be next. Uh, from a legal perspective, uh, it should be noted the, the, the following two principles. In the first place, the principle of necessity. Do we really need restrictions on gambling advertising? Uh, let's, face the, uh, or let's say that the gambling problem in Spain uh, affects to a 0.4% of the players. So we do not have a real problem uh, with gambling players. That's the first place. In the second place, it should be also noted the principle of uh, of, um, uh, <laughs> of uh, proportionality. Okay, uh, so to what extent these restrictions should be applicable? And last but not least, uh, taking into account how uh, this uh, populist mo movement wants to, to have things approved from one day to another in order to gather votes and things like that, uh, it should be noted that whatever uh, is published in, in, the, in, in the decree should be subject to public consultation, taking into account the huge impact that, uh, that this activity uh, has got in Spain. Last year, uh, uh, there were 110 million uh, invested by the gambling companies in, in, me in the different uh, media. Uh, that's from a legal perspective. From a pragmatic perspective, the sooner that we have a gambling, uh, a, 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 gambling uh, dec uh, a decree on gambling advertising, the better. Because the, the noise right now, uh, not only at political level, but also at the media level, uh, every second day there is news against, uh, against the industry and so on, and this is going to go higher. And, and the political situation, if we think that we are bad now, we can be still worse. 
And so the sooner the better. And we have a, furthermore, we have a regulator right now that fully, understand the, the, fully understands the industry. There is a very technical guy that does not take anything for granted, that do not feel the pressure, does not feel the pressure coming from the media or politicians or whatsoever. And this will be the best one in order to, to issue such a draft. Okay, so, so you believe that something is coming, but perhaps not the, the full ban on, 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 on marketing? For sure it will not be a full ban. Uh, this is already clear. And the fact that we had two previous uh, drafts on, or two previous bills on gambling advertising is going to help. Because somehow this new uh, government, uh, the first thing that they said is we need to uh, <coughs> ban this activity. But they were told, look, uh, the DGOJ, our regulator, has been working on this matter for three years already and had something already nearly cooked that uh, you should give to that an opportunity. Might be more restrictive than the last version, but it will not be a, a full ban on advertising. If that happens, that's why I said the sooner the better, within the next six to eight months. If we go to general elections, things will be delayed, and God knows who, which will be the next government, who will be the next regulator, etc. Thank you, thank you. Quirino, a full ban on marketing. That seems to be a good idea. Or do you disagree? <laughs> it's the easy way, isn't it? Is it uh, we, don't need, we don't need to care about uh, these uh, problems with gambling advertisements anymore. Or is it, is it targeting the right group, you think? Is it solving the problems? Well. Uh, Morton, I, I, the answer to that is, uh, it makes me think of um, a bunch of kids playing in a courtyard with a ball and being very noisy and very <laughs> intrusive uh, to the neighborhood. And uh, instead of someone just going down the courtyard and maybe punching the ball and uh, uh, pushing the kids away, he just uh, takes a Kalashnikov and shoots. <laughs> in the courtyard uh, and, uh, and, 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 and makes a bloodshed. That's, that's what I have in mind when I hear about, um, when I first heard, heard about the, the, the blanket gambling advertising ban in Italy. What can I say? It was a very unfortunate day for the industry, um, but my first uh, reaction to that was, uh, you guys should have known that it was coming. And, and, and you did not do anything to prevent that from happening. Uh, let's face it, the industry was too focused, too focused on just counting the money in and uh, trying to conquer any, any space, any spot in the sun, any kind of visibility to worry about the collateral effects. They didn't pay attention to how badly they were being treated by the media. They didn't pay attention to those consumer associations that were becoming ever more vocal about um, gambling addiction problems uh, and uh, related issues. And uh, I should join my, my, my friend Santi uh, on the fact that even in Italy, we do not have a big issue about gambling addiction. It's, yes, there is a problem, there is a big problem, it's, uh, it's to be tackled, but again, you don't just take the Kalashnikov and shoot, because you're killing the industry altogether. So the first, um, the first um, comment that I make is, uh, shame to the industry. The industry did not do anything to prevent that. They didn't do any lobbying, they didn't do any communication, they didn't do anything to diversify themselves, the guys who hold the license back in Italy versus the guys who have no license and who are still f causing lots of mud to go and hit the, the, the roof, like uh, uh, you may have read on the Times of Malta front line yesterday about this major investigation involving um, Malta-based um, companies run by a bunch of Italians, uh, all coming from southern Italy. The, the legal industry, the licensed industry, did, do, uh, did not do anything to say, we are the good guys. We hold the license, we pay taxes, we care about consumer protection, because 
we have to do that because there are regulations, we are fully compliant, and we are different from the bad guys. So the industry did nothing. On top of that, like in Spain, we had this major disgrace of uh, uh, giving the keys of the cabinet room to a bunch of very incompetent people, very incompetent, very biased, very um, mm, ignorant in terms of uh, how the business works. And I'm not saying that uh, just looking at what, I, what they did in, uh, to the gaming industry. I, I could uh, entertain this audience uh, by telling you guys how miserably they are at the moment handling the state affairs uh, when it comes to any other business. The same kind of very biased, politicized, um, ill-judged approach, they are using it to, uh, you name it, to how to reform the, the pensions, how to uh, grant a minimum salary to anybody um, in, in, uh, in terms of uh, showing that they're doing something about uh, uh, the country. Uh, they are at loggerheads with the, the European Communion about uh, uh, the budget issues, etc. So that's exactly their signature approach to running the state. So, uh, the industry did, didn't do no, anything uh, to prevent that. Uh, the, the, the rulers, the new government, uh, was too incompetent uh, uh, and too biased to know how to deal in a sound way with issues that are there, because we should not underestimate um, this um, massive impact of uh, massive advertising, gambling advertising. It is an issue. Okay, but a, 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 a professional approach, a sound approach to the issue would have been for the new government, as soon as they stepped up the plate, to call the industry, the stakeholders, and, and tell them, guys, this is not going well, this is not good, it's not in the best interest of the consumers. I give you 60 days to come back to me with proposals which you will have to deliver the next day failing which I will take action. That would have been a clever, sound, um, healthy approach to the issue. Instead, they just took the Kalashnikov and, sh and shot, and here we are. Yeah. Which is, uh, I think the way industry has uh, definitely, if they didn't wake up after what happened in UK, they definitely have woken up now. I am in, currently in discussions in the Danish industry about an ethical code of conduct that the government has, uh, has requested uh, and there's none of the operators who, who think now that nothing bad could happen to them. None of them believes that anymore. They've seen what has happened in the UK, they've seen what happened, has happened in, it, in Italy, and they're scared. Uh, so, but that is a political reality now. I know there's been a challenge of the, uh, of, of the ban. Uh, where, does it, uh, where does it stand now, and, 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 and how do you operate in the meantime? The challenge <coughs> was, uh, was, was um, uh, thrown by um, a licensed uh, s a Scandinavian uh, operator called Leo Vegas, who became very uh, vocal about this uh, gambling ban. They hold a license in Italy and they uh, uh, felt obliged to file a complaint with the European Commission. But, but because, of course, that ban um, uh, infringes the European law principles, uh, the, the proportionality uh, rule uh, uh, that Santi was making reference to before, etc. Uh, that, that is uh, unquestionable, okay? Maybe um, they ought to have also uh, notified that ban in advance to the Commission if you consider that to be technical rules that are going to be introduced uh, to any given uh, industry, in which case, as technical rules, the European law says that you first need to notify the Commission. The Commission will, will share this with all member states. If there are any objections, they will have to be addressed by the proposing state. And only after that, the, the, after the so-called standstill period, then can you go ahead and implement the new rules. Anyway, nothing like that was done. Uh, there is a, a complaint pending before the Commission. The fact of the matter is that, as many of you may know, 
things in Brussels do not proceed at a very speedy pace. <laughs> it's a, a highly political rather than legal issue. Um, at the moment, there is so much tension and friction between Rome and Brussels that um, you don't want to add uh, additional dynamite to a big bomb that it's there ready to blow off. So uh, I, I, I fully understand where Leo Vegas is coming from. I fully endorse their initiative. I don't think that uh, this is going to result in any breakthrough anytime soon. What I think is that uh, uh, come the 1st of January uh, 2019, when the ban will become fully effective, we will have to see how it gets enforced by the law enforcement authorities, and in particular by the telecoms uh, agency that is in charge of enforcing it. This, in my view, will almost inevitably result in uh, uh, legal, uh, in judicial, judicial outcomes, uh, um, uh, operators that will be hit by the fines, by the restrictions, will uh, challenge those restriction, restrictions before domestic courts, and domestic courts will issue rulings about that. That's how things will happen. Uh, uh, and in the meantime, uh, the, the proceedings in Brussels will continue, but I expect, uh, if anything to happen, to happen at domestic level before domestic courts. Okay, thank you. So for the last uh, 12, 13 minutes, I would like to turn to something uh, related, but slightly different, uh, because this panel is not only about consumer protection, it's also about responsible gambling. Uh, and uh, there was talk, I think, in the previous panel about using AI for, uh, for uh, detecting responsible gambling uh, behavior, addictive behavior. And I know that uh, countries such as the Netherlands, maybe the UK, definitely Sweden, are talking about the duty of care, so the, the care that you have uh, as an operator for, for, the, for the player. <coughs> and uh, I would like each of you to comment on uh, what has been done in terms of um, arranging for the, or sorry, requesting the operators to be using tools to detect uh, problem gambling behavior and whether you see that this is something that is, is, is developing and it even becomes sort of a, a liability maybe for the operator to make sure that the, that the, uh, that the player is not becoming an addict. Chris, maybe you could, uh, you could start. Absolutely, that's a very live and topical issue in the UK at the moment. I mean, particularly in the wake of uh, many of these public statements, one, on one side of things, you've got AML, so a failure to conduct monitor, and monitor your customer for AML reasons. The other side, the flip side, related, is a, a perceived failure in, in a series of operators failing to, to abide by conditions which attach to the li their license to do just as you're saying. So identify, track customer behaviors, identify when they might be exhibiting a sign of a problem and interacting with them. What we've seen in the numerous public statements that have come out uh, is that operators just haven't had systems that are nearly good enough from the commission's perspective to do just that. Off the back of those public statements, what we've seen a lot more of is um, Custom, uh, customers looking to seek to recover the money that they may have lost to an operator, seeking to allege that you should have stopped me. Now, we're actually even seeing law firms sell their services to, to customers to, uh, to seek to try and recover money lost to, to, to operators. In the UK, the concept of a duty of care has a very, uh, as a legal meaning, is uh, a, a potentially dangerous one for operators in that it could attract potential civil liability to the customer. The position in the UK is, and there's case law to this effect, it's, is that actually the, the operators do not currently owe a duty of care to their players in the same way that a doctor might to a patient, um, such that actually as a, as a matter of civil liability, uh, it, it would be p problematic for a customer, I think, to seek to recover money that they may have lost on, on the grounds that an operator may have not observed a, a regulatory responsibility to identify and perhaps interact with a customer earlier than they might otherwise have done. That said, we haven't seen yet an example of uh, a customer go through to the courts, or at least or not that I'm aware of, go through to the courts to actually, in the, in the current climate that we're in, seeking to challenge that legal reasoning, but certainly the position as it is in the UK. 
what that produces is an environment, and this is kind of indicative of the relationship between some, a small pool of customers and operators, that you have customers that perhaps don't have a problem, but are actually seeking to test the systems that are in place by operators by seeking to often, and the compliance people in the room, I'm sure, will be well aware of this issue, seeking to deposit significant amounts of money in very short periods of time, spend it with an operator, and then seeking to recover that, <coughs> saying, you should have stopped me, you should have stopped me, even though, because they know that, you know, if, and then, you know, threatening to complain to the regulator when, when they don't. Um, that challenge is being faced in a very real sense by operators day to day. Yannicka, do you, what, what is in, in place in, uh, in, oh. in uh, Malta? And the, the new legislation actually introduces for the first time an obligation on operators to, m to um, have tools that monitor player behavior. So this is actually a requirement. It's a, a requirement that's only been recently introduced, and that is why we are still in the process of monitoring it. What I can say is that there are a few operators who are really leading the way in, in this aspect, and they really have, um, have these tools that they even offer for free to to players in order to monitor their own behavior, and while others are, are actually um, slacking behind in, in this respect. What I can say is that we're monitoring this very closely, and um, we, will be, we will be looking into any enforcement we would need to take on this matter. But obviously, it's a very fine line in, in terms of liability, as, as Chris was saying. Um, uh, but we also, and I think this is even more important, we also oblige operators to train their staff to be able to actually see if a player is exhibiting signs of problem gambling and then um, through whatever channel the, the player uses to, to, talk to, the pla to talk to the operator itself. We are still receiving um, and we, will, we are open <coughs> to continue receiving any complaints about the, the manner in which, in which the, an operator handles, handles his, his gaming service. Um, but obviously, disputes will need to be referred to alternative dispute resolution centers, um, as, as, is, as is the law across all the EU. But we are monitoring this very closely, and, um, and we are seeing that while some operators are actually leading the way, others um, still have a long way to go. Of course, it is, it is hard to set um, a single standard across all operators because the, the difference in size is very real and the difference in resources is very real but um, that will not in any way take away from the importance of monitoring um, monitoring your players and, and not taking on more than you can handle because if you can't monitor your players then, then you're out of your depth. I wonder from a regulatory perspective how do you, uh, how, how, how is that requirement satisfied do you, do you check or do the, does the operator have to demonstrate that this is working or do they, do they have to uh, choose acknowledged tools? Uh, because for me, I don't know much about the, 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 the tools, but to me it seems like it's not, a, it's not really a science. It's not a, it's not a defined science yet. So, so, so how do I demonstrate to you that I, I, that I satisfy the requirement? The truth is, for the time being, what we're realizing is that it's, it's more of a practical approach. If, when, upon receiving an and com player's complaint to the, to the regulator, um, we will receive hundreds every, every, every day. So what I can say is that, uh, practically, we are able to monitor both at a compliance audit stage and at a, and at a licensing audit stage of what tools are in place and, and operators are open to demonstrate what they have <laughs> and, and the way it works. But mostly it's from a practical perspective because the more complaints and, and the more disputes are referred to ADR entities from a particular operator, we monitor those reports and then we are able to see um, that, for example, an operator is having a lot of disputes and complaints arising from one particular issue and we are able to see that that player was not actually monitoring the way that operator, excuse me, was not monitoring the way it should have been. So it's a very um, practical and probably an exposed approach which enab and the, at the compliance stage which enables us to check because as you said, there is no one list of, of tools which you can employ and, and tools which you can use. So it is a, it's a learning curve for everyone involved, of course, also for us. So. Santiago, what uh, requirements and what liability is placed on the operator in, in Spain for, for, well, for checking? In Spain, in terms of uh, responsible gambling, we are not different to others. I mean, we have the classical uh, me technical measures to be adopted at the time of uh, licensing your product, like uh, daily, weekly, or monthly deposit limits, uh, uh, the time for the sessions when you are playing slots, etc. Uh, at the end, uh, we know that uh, this uh, tsunami, if I was speaking before the Italian tsunami, of course, the, 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 the British tsunami is also coming to Spain in terms of uh, responsible gambling, and we know that uh, 
the regulator is cooking something, but uh, he's not uh, very transparent at the moment because everything is uh, being prepared, but not has not been any uh, formal announcement about what he's going to do. What he has made clear is that he's really interested in uh, artificial intelligence at the time of detecting uh, problematic uh, conducts and so on. And that comes together uh, with announcement they, uh, done by uh, two or three days ago but by uh, the main operator in Spain, which is uh, Bet365, saying that they are going to uh, uh, invest and, and, and uh, analyze uh, in, uh, in artificial intelligence uh, regarding responsible gambling and that that will be shared with the rest of the industry for the benefit of it. Uh, my view is that, uh, of course, responsible gambling measures need to be adopted uh, 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 in the regulations and so on, and this is a very important thing. But at the end of the day, you cannot, uh, uh, you cannot uh, request so many measures that uh, make the product unattractive and, and sends the player to the illegal market where all those restrictions do not apply. But that's the uh, that's a pragmatic lawyer speaking there. <laughs> what is the uh, what is the political climate in in Spain right now? Is is there political pressure on on the on the government to do more uh, towards responsible gambling? Absolutely yes, but uh, it comes uh, first. Uh, the, the, the first thing that has come uh, has been the, the, this uh, ban on advertising or, or or restrictions on advertising to to speak better. That by the way, uh, uh, is a different case than in Italy and. You know, can correct me if I'm wrong. In, in Italy, has been the cabinet directly, the one that has uh, put the ban on gambling. Mm. In uh, in Spain, uh, is the cabinet who is telling to the regulator this should be addressed in a different way, and then the regulator is the one that is going to cook it. Yeah. Well, similar things for 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 uh, for responsible gambling, no different uh, than uh, any other place. But no, there's no uh, particular measures that have been address by now. What can we do to block sort of news coming out of Italy? Because I met with a Danish MP the other day and he said, I think we should do like in Italy. That's, uh, <laughs> that, I'd like to avoid that. So, sorry, uh, what, uh, in what we're talking about here, what would be the, uh, the, uh, the, the viewpoint? At the, the moment, at the moment, uh, the, the regulations uh, are that uh, every operator needs to uh, warn players uh, to play responsibly, thank you, and then uh, um, to set uh, self-limitation uh, uh, standards or self-exclusion uh, as well. Um, but these are just generic um, requirements, broad requirements set out in the standard license agreement. Uh, there is nothing more, nothing less than that. The rest is left to the operators. And I think we need to, to um, admit that problem gambling is a, a big issue, first and foremost, for the operator themselves. Because having to cope with uh, you know, possible uh, complaint, customer complaints, consumer association complaints, reports, bad reports in the press, etc., it's not, it doesn't look good, and the industry doesn't need uh, any more mud, um, to use a light word. Um, so the operator is already very um, keen to, um, do, uh, to go the extra mile to do something that shows uh, their customers and also the regulator that they do care about uh, responsible gaming. However, we should never forget that uh, at the end of the day, uh, if you go too deep inside uh, issues like, uh, you know, who you are, how much you earn, uh, what are your assets, etc., this may trigger uh, a, a very mm, negative reaction on the consumer side because it, there, is, there are not so many uh, people out there who are willing to share with uh, an operator very private uh, um, and, and confidential information about their wealth, about the sources of income, etc. So there is a balance which is very delicate between regulations and requirements in terms of consumer protection, what the, uh, the operator should be doing extra, and of course, uh, using AI is a great remedy, although uh, as far as uh, uh, the Italian market is concerned, I think we are a good while away from introducing those very innovative and costly 
um, and AI devices. But at the end of the day, the answer is uh, uh, it, it, the, un the, the right answer to consumer protection I uh, issues is uh, a, a mix, a balanced mix of uh, regulations and uh, operators' practice. That's where you find the, the right equilibrium. Thank you. I think we are out of time, uh, but I hope that we, in the short time we had available, gave you a good uh, snapshot of the situation in some key jurisdictions in Europe. And I want to thank my panel for great contributions. Thank you. Thank you, Morton. IMGL Masterclass Dr. Jürg Hoffmann Melkers Maria McDonald Nordic Gambling Bartosz Andrushanitz WH Partners Justin Franzen Kalf Katz and Franzen Andreas Glaner MME Moderated by Robert Zamit WH Partners <laughs> Good morning. Thank you for joining us on this panel. Um, I, I would like to first introduce um, our IMGL Masterclass. IMGL, first of all, for those of you who are not very familiar, is International Masters of Gaming Law, which is a non-profit organization comprising over 340 lawyers in the gaming industry. Um, and today with us we have a, quite a very good gaming lawyer team here, um, uh, very well established in the industry. I would like to first introduce Dr. Jörg Hoffmann, who's from Melchers, from Germany, and he has been also the immediate past president of IMGL. We have Maria McDonald from Nordic Gambling. Um, and so she's a Swedish lawyer, and she al has also been in-house um, in, in an op in, in operator and in the gaming industry. We have Bartosz, who is from our team, from WH Partners, but he's from our Warsaw office, and he will be speaking about Poland and the regulator, regulations there. <laughs> Justin from Karl Katz and Frenzen from Holland. Well, very, very little to say about Justin. Most of us know him as, as well as one of our deleting um, lawyers in the industry in Holland. And next to me is Andreas Glarner from MME from Switzerland as well. And, and I, IT, IP, gaming lawyer, uh, very established as well. So I wanted to start as a regulatory panel. We, we wanted to discuss about the updates that are ongoing in the industry. And the first jurisdiction I wanted to start off with was maybe Sweden, Maria, <laughs> because obviously it is the hot topic of the day. The, all our operators here in Malta have been very keen, or maybe not, um, on, on, on what's going on and what's happening in Sweden. Maybe you can give us a, a small update of what's happening currently. I will be glad to. Uh, well, I'm very fortunate to have this um, buzz around Sweden. Everyone's asking questions, <laughs> as you can imagine. Uh, most of you will know that uh, Sweden has a new gambling act coming into force on 1st of January, and the regulator has accepted license applications from 1st of August. As you can imagine, we are getting closer to when licenses are going to be issued. Um, and the latest update is from last night. I got an email from one of the case handlers at the gambling authority at half past eight in the evening. Um, and maybe some regulators usually work that late, but uh, it's certainly not the common thing in Sweden. And, uh, the, it was a very detailed question on one of the applicants who, applications we've been working on, and it was absolutely essential that he had the reply this morning. 
Okay. So hopefully this means that uh, they are in the last legs of processing the applications, and um, I expect or hope that they will start uh, issuing their first batch this week. Ah, very good. So we're very close to actually start seeing documents starting to yeah, be exactly. published and yeah. issued. So if you see me fidgeting on my phone instead <laughs> of talking to you, it's because I'm hoping for an update. Ah, all right. So it's a very current situation in Sweden, obviously, with everyone um, applying and getting to, to be on top of things when it comes to legislation. But are you expecting that, therefore, with this legislation, there will be more operators or just the fact that those who were already pretty much there are just getting their license? Well, I have to say that I find it difficult to know exactly how many operators there are in Sweden today because there are 300 brands, but of course there can be more operators behind each brand, um, or one Less. operator behind more than one <laughs> brand. Um, uh, that, so currently we have approximately 300 brands targeting the Swedish market. We know that a couple of weeks ago there were 75 license applications handed in. A couple of weeks ago, so it could be up to 80 now. There are, it is allowed to apply for more than one brand under one license. So, but I don't think that we will see 300 brands maybe from 1st of January, but there will be certainly be a, a large number. Um, of course, not everyone will have a license from 1st of January, unfortunately. I see. And um, moving on to another jurisdiction, Justin, <laughs> will we ever see <coughs> this kind of situation in Holland? Well, <laughs> that's, a <laughs> that's a trick question. <laughs> Don't start with a trick question. A million dollar question. A million dollar question as well. Actually, I'm very jealous of Maria because, um, uh, as, as most of you probably know, the regulatory process in the Netherlands to, to regulate remote started years ago. Um, and Sweden simply overtook us. Um, you know, the question we're getting twice a week at least, uh, is, you know, when, oh, when uh, is, your or <coughs> is the regulation kicking in? Uh, honestly, I stopped trying to answer that question. I'll just give you the official line of the government here. <laughs> um, what, what essentially happened in the last couple of weeks, uh, the lower regulation was put out for consultation. Uh, the Ministry of Security and Justice received about 26 uh, public submissions for that consultation. Uh, the same amount came in, uh, but then uh, on a confidential uh, basis. Uh, it's about seven centimeters of paperwork the ministry has to, to go through. And um, right after that, I think a second part of secondary regulation, which is called the ministerial decree, will also be put out for public consultation. Uh, and then we're almost there. Uh, and almost is, of course, the, the, the most important and final stage is the voting uh, or the handling and the voting of the bill in the Senate. <coughs> we are hoping, together with the ministry, that uh, this is going to take place no later than, let's say, February of next year. The reason why this February uh, month is so important is that in March, the provincial elections will, will start, which will then lead up to the composition of a new Senate. And whilst I think if you, if you do the headcount in the Senate currently, I think there is a small majority for passing the bill, but obviously we don't know what we're going to get uh, with, with, with the new Senate. Of course. So, uh, fingers crossed again. Again. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, that then, you know, what, what's the go live date? Eh? The constant question, when, oh, when? Can we, can we operate with Dutch license? Um, well, if nothing goes wrong, and, you know, all, there's always something that at least goes wrong, but if nothing goes wrong, uh, the, the, the date would be uh, July of 2020. Uh, but there's a lot that needs, still needs to happen. Uh, the bill has to... Uh, oh, sorry, the lower regulation has to be checked by the European Commission, of by course. the Council of State, plus, also very important, the gambling authority is looking to uh, put out a public consultation also for the license application process which is, I think, a very good thing. And hopefully that prevents uh, uh, dramas during mm. the uh, during actual the application, yeah. uh, the sort of dramas we're maybe seeing in Sweden <laughs> to a certain extent. But 
sure, Maria, you can elaborate on that more. Thank you, Justin. Um, what about Switzerland, Andres? Has there been any recent changes which will lead us into a, a, a licensing regime eventually? Yeah, I mean, Justin, you said you're envious of Maria. <laughs> I actually envy both of you. Uh, we have the same situation as in Sweden. We do have new regulations kicking in first January, most likely. It's not fully clear, but highly expected. But I would prefer to be in a situation where they would not kick in and we would still be in the legislation process. Uh, essentially, what turned out in those years where um, those regulations were drafted, the result is, uh, well, I would say, very unfortunate. It's about foreclosing the Swiss market for online operators and only granting licenses, online licenses to terrestrial casinos in Switzerland. So that was the result of... So basically, rather than opening up the market for possible more entries, we're just limiting to the current ones which have a, a land-based structure which would, lo would like to also go over into the remote. Yeah, exactly. So the starting November, the first license application will be filed by the land-based casinos, some of them, and they're probably going to be granted until mid-2019. So we expect the first Swiss online casinos to go live in July 19, currently. And also by that time, uh, IP blocking measures will be put into force, so non-Swiss licensed providers will be blocked. So right. what we're seeing at the end of the day is also that it's not just a regulatory framework which would limit the possibility of entering, but also a technical limitation which will also bring into the picture a situation of blocking of anyone who wants to offer their games into Switzerland. Absolutely correct. I see. So maybe, yes, I, I, I have to agree with you that maybe you are um, in a worse situation than, <laughs> than our colleagues from, from Holland and uh, Sweden. It is. I mean, what we see now, obviously, every online operator asks himself the question, well, what is our strategy for Switzerland yes. for the coming future? There the are various options how to deal with the situation. Uh, one is certainly to collaborate with a Swiss casino. That, that is one option. That has some limitations to that, uh, which we maybe can address later on. Uh, another one is just try to continue operations. Another, a third one is to kind of uh, get out of the market voluntarily and come back at the later stage mm. with a new license, uh, which shall be most likely um, implemented in 2022. So there is a possibility that eventually <coughs> in the future there would be some kind of opening. Um, there's a, this possibility connected to new terrestrial licenses. Still. Still. I see. Yeah. So what about Germany? <laughs> well, listening to, <coughs> to Maria makes me jealous, um, <laughs> so well. even to Justin, because uh, um, Sweden was like Germany back then, <laughs> was like Germany is today, trying to consolidate the monopoly, the state monopoly, and uh, by way of <coughs> violating the freedom of services. And now Sweden managed to establish licensing regime after a couple of years, Holland, the Netherlands, is very close to that result, and Germany is still struggling. Um, for years, I'm sitting on panels discussing providing updates in Germany, and I always say something is happening, something will be different in the near future. <laughs> Actually, that is the case, and it's still the case now, but it's not the big news we all are waiting for, meaning a revolutionary new regulation that provides casino licenses for online casino operators. It's still a discussion. To update you uh, briefly, in a nutshell, I need to distinguish between Germany in total as the Federal Republic and a part of Germany, which is the northernmost land, or you can also say federal state Schleswig-Holstein, because um, in both parts, significant changes are really ahead. I assume that because we're here in Malta, <coughs> many of you are very familiar with the German situation because it's a very important market for Maltese operators. But um, the things you need to know about the German regulation is, since it's a federal republic, we have 16 prime ministers being involved in discussing new regulation. And the legal framework is a so-called interstate treaty signed by all these prime ministers and that provides the regulatory environment in, in Germany, saying that online, bait, uh, online gaming is completely prohibited, 
with one exception that applies for sports betting based on a so-called experimental clause. The idea was seven years ago, almost seven years ago, to issue some licenses to operators and see how it works, but only for sports betting. None of these licenses has ever been issued, has ever been granted to an operator. The whole, trans <coughs> the whole, the whole proceeding, the application got stuck in litigation and collapsed and was, by the way, found un, uh, unlegal um, and violating the freedom of services by the European Court of Justice in its INSA decision in February 2016. This means that sports betting operators, if they are located somewhere within the European Union, can claim for themselves to operate uh, full compliance in Germany, full compliantly, fully compliant in Germany, uh, as long as they follow certain rules and re meet standard requirements like KYC, not targeting minors, and so on. So it's safe to say, as a sports betting operator, you're always safe. There are some details uh, which I will not mention now, but uh, that is one part of the industry. Online casino is still fully prohibited with the exception of Schleswig-Holstein, because Schleswig-Holstein introduced their own gambling act in 2012, 2013, and after a change in government, it was revoked, and now the old parties, the former parties, are back in power, and uh, although the interstate treaty has been signed by every, every German state, um, they're going to think about their future in order to change things. Because the issue in Schleswig-Holstein is the old licenses um, will expire very soon. Sports betting licenses expired already. First licenses expired in May. And since the old gambling act has not been renewed, they could not extend the duration of these licenses or issue new licenses. And the regulator here was very, very creative. They had a great idea. They say, we now offer a so-called transition regulation. It's an interim regulation which will be valid uh, as long as there is no new regulation in place, may it be in Germany or in, in Schleswig-Holstein only, and as long as this period is lasting, um, every sports betting operator who is going to apply for that confirmation of, apply, of compliance will be able to claim that he is fully compliant, operating in, in uh, Schleswig-Holstein, limited to Schleswig online or only. It's not a license, but it's more than just a toleration. This was possible because the experimental clause of the Interstate Treaty provided regulation for sports betting. But for online casino, the legal situation is different because there uh, we, ho we do have this internet ban, which has been confirmed as being legal by the highest German administrative court a year ago. We discussed this a year ago. And so they cannot introduce this interim regime. They have to make a decision very shortly because these licenses are about to expire. Mm -hmm. and also, payment processors are asking, will we be able to process uh, your payment transfer next year on a solid, proper legal basis or not? If not, we cannot continue. And TV stations, broadcasting stations, radio stations are asking, can we book or will you book advertising commercials for next year? Or will it not be possible because advertising for illegal products will not be possible, of course? So within the next weeks, we expect uh, a decision. Um, there is a Prime Minister's meeting uh, now in, I think it's December 5. I hope it's the right date, but it will be in December. And the, the previous meeting took place late October. And the Prime Ministers postponed the, um, the decision. Uh, they instructed a so-called working group of state chancellors, which is kind of the back office for the Prime Ministers, to come up with, an, with a proposal how to regulate, first of all, how to uh, continue with the experimental clause for sports betting, if to extend it or to replace it or to renew the interstate treaty and then to come up with, an, with a regulation proposal that includes online casino games. There's still reluctancy, at least with 13 of 16 German states, to allow online gaming regulation, but at least the proposal should create an alternative regulation, including online casinos. And um, depending on the outcome of the Prime Minister's meeting in December, which I think will not be significant because the next one in, Ma in March, uh, March 19, will be more important because then they have to make decisions. But depending on that outcome, Schleswig-Holstein will decide on how to continue. Uh, if there is no, um, no regulation, including online casino operators in sight, I think their only way could be to uh, pass a new law. I don't think they would pass a gaming act. This would be a problematic diplomatic behavior, but they could allow 
kind of an interim, interim regime for the online casinos, perhaps confirming that those who have licenses, existing licenses now, could continue for a while un, uh, until new regulation comes in place. I think this is something which is likely, it cannot guarantee it, but this is what happens now in terms of regulation. So it's interesting times. When we have time later, I'm happy to talk about enforcement. There's also change in enforcement, and um, there's also um, a, a certain Ministry of the Interior in Lower Saxony looking at the payment sector. So if we have time, we can come back to that. Of course. For the time being, I guess, this is the nutshell I wanted to provide. <laughs> all right, and Bartosz, where does Poland stand in, in all these situations? Is it similar to Holland, to Sweden, Switzerland? I think I should move closer to... Come <laughs> over. <laughs> yes. <laughs> should, yes. <laughs> uh, in Poland, the situation in terms of current developments is uh, probably more steady than in all of the jurisdictions we, we uh, discussed so far. Uh, the main development in terms of legal framework took place uh, in April last year when the blacklisting was introduced to the Polish legal system. And this, of course, affected the way the offshore operators were, uh, were able to provide their services to, uh, to the market. Before, the license operators, and there were very, very few of them, enjoyed something in between 8 to 10% of the entire uh, betting market uh, uh, in Poland. The rest because of the very unfavorable taxation in Poland was basically taken by the offshore operators who uh, operated in, uh, in the gray zone. So after many years of, of uh, strong lobbying from the side of the onshore operators, most of them are Polish companies, but not most of them are Polish companies, uh, the government decided to introduce the blacklisting, which changed the picture completely. Now the uh, g gaming associations in Poland, they s estimate that approximately 50 to 60 percent of the market is in hands of the Polish uh, operators. There are eight or nine of them right now, including the two recent uh, additions to the list, uh, namely BetClick and Sherry, which decided to enter this market, which is difficult and challenging uh, for most of the operators and for lawyers uh, uh, as well. Why? First of all, the, the possibility of uh, entering Polish market legally, I mean, in line with Polish law, which can be challenged on the basis of its non-compliance with the EU law, but I don't think we have time to, to go into details. Uh, so, uh, basically, the, the, uh, there, are two ways, the, there were two ways the recent operators entered the market. One was, uh, on one hand, fighting with the government and challenging the blacklisting, which basically meant that the entire Polish law was challenged. At the same time, the same operator was able to secure the license. The other one took a completely different approach, withdraw from the market, uh, opened a company in Poland. Polish government uh, really does not uh, pay attention to hitting the, the fact that they are basically making this for money. They, they are inducing uh, foreign operators to establish companies in Poland, and they are making this pretty much clear. Uh, pretty much clear. This was also the reason why the, uh, the government introduced, the lawmaker introduced, a full monopoly on all other games than betting. And this is the problem which, uh, which every single operator faces, whether it is a, a good choice to enter Poland with only one product uh, in your hand. Because basically, when you enter the, the market with a limited product, at the same time, you probably stop uh, your operations in, in let's say, gray, gray zone, not to have basically fights with the regulator on the, the daily basis, especially the regulator like uh, everywhere, I guess, enjoy a broad uh, uh, right to, for example, uh, revoke your, uh, your license. On the other hand, Poland is, a, is, in terms of betting, Poland is a mature market uh, uh, with almost 40 million people who play uh, often and uh, willingly. So this is probably uh, also interesting uh, thing to consider, whether it's worth to be in Poland and just having betting hoping that at one on one day I will be, you know, uh, able to finally change my, uh, you know, tone of my speaking and say something more interesting for, uh, for the audience. Uh, or to just look and see. And many operators uh, who are active on the Polish market, many big brands, they withdraw from the market the day before the blacklisting uh, come into play. And they are just awaiting uh, what is going to happen. And what is going to happen, briefly. So from from the legislative point of view, I don't expect any uh, changes in the upcoming months. Uh, 
Poland is uh, now in a very difficult political situation. I think that everyone may have heard about this. We will have national elections in uh, October or November next year, and there is a hope that this will uh, mean the change of the government. So maybe the new government will be more, more open to discussing uh, developing a, a licensed market in, in Poland. The other way is that I mentioned the challenging. Uh, some of the operators challenge the law, and they are willing to bring the cases uh, to the ECJ. ECJ never actually commented on the Polish Gambling Act, and. The judges will have lots of things to say, I, I hope, when they, w when they see the, 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 the complaints we filed. So this is the other option. It may well be the case that in some t uh, at some point of time, I don't expect this happening in the next year, probably 2020, looking at, at how quickly ECJ uh, reacts, but hopefully this will be the other uh, development we'll hear at some point, uh, that because of the decisions of the ECJ, the law will either have to be changed or will simply become ineffective towards the offshore operators from the EU. Is, is there a possibility of also having other type of games other than other than betting? Could, could they come in with adding maybe skill games or is also skill games out of the question? Well, uh, anything which uh, can be defined as gambling, online gambling, uh, everything except online uh, betting is prohibited. But it's, of course, it's not prohibited, it's subject to the monopoly, which yet not started, not, not started the operation so far, even the law was introduced some time ago, in April 2017, they are, you know, so far they were organizing national lottery and scratch cards, now they will be running a fully-fledged online casino. So, uh, so no, in terms of online, this is just betting, betting. Uh, plus virtual betting, of course. Of course, understood. And Mar Maria, I come back to you now. From, from a product perspective and also we, um, I understand there are two types of licenses an operator can go for. Yeah. Um, this is, is online betting and online casino, right? So online casino is correct. Uh, it also includes online bingo. Okay. Uh, some online casino is actually called online commercial gambling. Uh, it includes certain table games, dice games, um, online bingo and slots. And then we have betting, and it's um, a betting license includes both online and land-based betting. I see. Uh, so two kinds, yes. And, and I also would like to say that I'm grateful or happy that my fellow panelists say that uh, they're jealous of me, mm -hmm. but I'm not. Uh, I also want to say that it's, uh, to put it mildly, been a challenging year, um, especially I think for operators. Um, I'm not jealous of how they have worked and the little information and guidance they've had from both the regulations, everything has come out late. It's been difficult to um, send in the right kind of documents because it's all been down to lack of time. Um, the law was passed through Parliament in the summer and six months is a very short period for a regulator to prepare all the documents and it's definitely a very short period for operators to, to file and gather all the documents as well. And uh, they keep coming up new requests from the Gambling Authority. It's not that they are, mm, some of them are maybe unreasonable, but not all of them. Uh, I understand some of them, but they could maybe have come four months ago and not last week. Yes, and, this, I, I, and I believe it is also a challenge from the authorities' perspective. Maybe we can understand that this is for them a new thing totally. Of course. <laughs> it's, it's a learning curve from their for end. Them, and they have had to deal with monopolies and non-for-profit organizations. All of a sudden, they have 75 license applications from an industry where they or many of them don't have much experience, if any. And they obviously had to recruit new staff, and this new staff, it, for anyone, it takes a long time to learn. So uh, I don't think we can blame the regulator. Uh, to some extent, everything can be made better, but it's a new area for, for them as well. But it's, uh, yes, it's been a lot of fun, but <laughs> definitely a lot of challenges as well to have everything in place. Just to mention one example, it's maybe, what can it be, two weeks ago now that the Gambling Authority realized that there's something called white labels. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> so uh, maybe they had realized before, but they realized that they needed some more information about white labels. 
So operators had one week to gather information uh, and send in information of the white label partners, contact persons, domains. That in itself is not such a big problem. But also to send in the contracts. Uh, and uh, to all of a sudden have that in place and for the gambling regulator this close to the new year, having to go through and look through all this. It's, um, it's for sure a challenge for operators, but also the regulator. So it's not just uh, interesting times, but also very challenging times. <laughs> of, it's of been one heck of a year, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> let's put it that way. And fr fr from a side of, of challenges, because I, this is the second, the second main topic I wanted to discuss also with the other pan panelists. What, 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 what were this year's challenges from uh, your jurisdictions and what are expected as the next challenges coming in um, when it comes to next year. So if, if, if we take Switzerland, what, what, what has been so struggling at this stage and, and what, what, what will be the next year's big, big thing from, from a challenge perspective in general? Well, of course, the big issue this year in Switzerland was how to deal with an operator, how to deal with the new regulations to be put into place uh, starting 1st January, how to treat the Swiss market. Swiss, Swiss market, as you know, it, it's not a big market, but it's for many operators a very profiting market. Uh, and it's also for many operators a growing market. So it's, um, it is a strategic question how to deal with it. So it also became to some extent our burden how, how to um, approach this challenge. So th this has been uh, certainly the challenge number one in 2018, and I believe it's going to be the same in 2019, because many just realized uh, probably the last couple of days that, oh, that this is changing in Switzerland, and they may have to do s take certain measures how to deal with these uh, changes. And you mentioned the possibility of also joining with a land base, but in reality, how many there are that land-based opportunities in, in, in reality. Is, is, is it that possible or it's, or it's just an or it is very limited um, opportunity? It is, I mean, as I said, Switzerland is small. We have uh, currently, I think, 21 land-based casinos. casinos. Uh, so there, there are not that many opportunities. Some of them are uh, in, in group structures, which reduces the possibilities uh, furthermore. And some of them decided not to apply for online licenses, at least in the first phase, and kind of to wait and see what's going to happen on the market. Others decided to set something up themselves, so they fall out of the picture. So I uh, think there remain only a few ones which were possible to collaborate with. So that was like the market side of things. There, there are collaboration possibilities which are being worked on as well. And, and the regulatory side of things make it even more difficult because Swiss law, as, a, as the secondary uh, legislation now, which has been released two weeks ago, uh, um, requests that in order to qualify as a, as a corporation partner, you need to have a so-called good reputation. And this good reputation requires that you have not actively targeted the Swiss, Swiss market, market for the past five years. It does not mean that you can't have had uh, Swiss customers, um, it's actually still unclear how this active targeting, what that consists of, but uh, we believe that the regulator will take a rather, uh, apply a rather low threshold. So if you have really done uh, like active advertisement for Swiss users and all these measures to, to build up a, a market in Switzerland, that you probably not qualify as a collaboration partner. That's, it's also not a possibility for you. Of course. So pretty much we have a situation of l low opportunity because of the low, l low number of casinos one can collaborate with, with the also even worse situation that if you have had an active approach towards Switzerland, you could even be disqualified. Yeah. What about the challenges in, in, in Holland? I mean, we, we know that the, the situation is as it is, but I mean, operations are still ongoing. I mean, there is still o online, there is still operations targeting the market. So what, what are the challenges that one is expecting to see in this coming year, apart from the issue of the legislation, obviously, which is... Yeah. Well, Robert, I think the, uh, the name of the game is enforcement. Uh, every, everything surrounding enforcement. I mean, it's been very difficult for us, in the, especially in the last couple of months, to give our clients a good steer 
yes. on what they should be doing to stay out of trouble. And as you know, when the gaming authority came into play in uh, five, six years ago, uh, it was relatively easy to, to give steer because you had these three prioritization criterion, uh, no Dutch language, no, uh, no active marketing, no radio, television, yeah. print, uh, media campaigns, and so forth. That sort of changed in July of last year with the addition of, of uh, uh, additional criterion, one of them being, you know, no IP block means that you're targeting the Dutch market and hence puts you in the crosshairs of, of, the, gaming, uh, of the gambling regulator. Um, that in itself has not been used uh, uh, per se by the gambling authority to start an, an enforcement case, uh, but we clearly see a shift to, let's say, operators who uh, seemingly are very compliant with all these criterion, and I have to add to this, they're, they're then not, com not compliant with the law, eh, because the, the law still says, well, you cannot accept Dutch players, so you're yes. in principle in breach of the 1964 Gaming Act, but still, uh, we see a shift to uh, attention on the payment mechanism. So if you have ideal as a payment mechanism, which is the payment mechanism of choice for most Dutch nationals, then this could trigger uh, enforcement with something smallish, you know, uh, maybe an app or uh, a, a, a Dutch help desk or some residual of affiliate course. marketing or whatever. But it's very, very difficult to give the right steer uh, to our clients on, you know, what they should be doing to stay out of trouble. That's the first thing. Secondly, on the 13th of September, uh, in the lower house, the, uh, the minister has instructed the gambling authority to work out the uh, motion baumeister, which is the, the bad actor. It's not a provision in, in the draft bill, but it's a motion that passed uh, parliament during the handling of the primary legislation. And it basically, uh, uh, the motion is very strict. It says, if you have been illegally on the market, should, you should be excluded from the future licensing process. Well, this has been watered down somewhat by the minister to say, well, no, uh, uh, we're not going to completely exclude you, but if you have received a fine, for instance, which you have paid, uh, you will get market access, but then that might be delayed. So you will not At be least. able to... You know, upon market opening, you will be excluded for, what, six months, a year? We don't know. But I this is something the, the ministry is working on together with the gambling authority. Uh, the ministry very well understands how it works and what they should be doing. Uh, but it's also very clear that the gambling authority is on, under a lot of political pressure. Of course. So uh, this is going to be a, an essential uh, development. Uh, plus, you know, how will, uh, how will operators be treated in the run-up to, to regulation? Uh, are they supposed to stop? Uh, are they supposed to uh, stop taking on new clients? Yeah. Uh, will there be a full database flushing? You know, we don't know all those uh, kind of details. Of course. And uh, these are all challenges also from an operator perspective, not just from a regulator, but also from a business decision, which yeah. at the end of the day would affect for some operators, this could be one of their main main target markets. Yes. The fact of the matter is that there's still many operators on the Dutch market, but obviously 99% of them have turned down their, their, uh, uh, their, their activities. Yeah, their, their activity. their activities, yeah. yeah. George, maybe from your end, from a challenge perspective in Germany, obviously last year we also had the issue, not, not just last year, but even before, of how to calculate how much you were to pay <laughs> in Germany. Is, is, it, is it still an issue? Is it still an open point? And what are the next other challenges when we're looking at, even from an enforcement perspective? Well, I'd say the, the biggest um, goal for the industry in 2018 was simply to survive, <laughs> just to be actively doing business in Germany. You may remember there are definitely people in this room, decision makers, who will remember a year ago, in October last year, after the Federal Administrative Court confirmed the legality of the total internet casino ban in Germany, uh, thinking about, do we have to drop off the market? Are we going to risk public prosecution? And we all know some big players with dropped off the market. With room, it yes. was Gauselman who announced during Sigma that they will no longer provide software, B2B business in Germany. 
A few weeks later, Novomatic announced the same, then operators pulled off the market for that reason, because they could not evaluate, is it still safe to operate? So those who made a different decision and survived are still on the market, although there was no one in these days, not even the superb lawyers in Germany, like my colleagues and myself, when many, many people came and, asked, came and asked that question, nobody could predict that it will be safe because in the written law and that confirmation, it's at least more riskful than it used to be. Although the law was always the same because they didn't change the law. They confirmed a legality, which, by the way, is not finally confirmed because this, this, this decision has been challenged and, and brought to the attention of the Federal Constitutional Court and still pending there. My personal view is it's a wrong and a political decision. <laughs> it's weakly reasoned, and it took five months, which is very unusual, until we could review the reasons. But now the challenge will be to survive again and to do everything that is possible to educate the regulators, the lawmakers, in order to provide a proper regulation that includes this business, the online casino business as well. And this is what the operators and the trade associations are going to move forward within the next couple of months. Time is flying. All right, very well. Th thanks a lot for those comments as well. Bartosz, maybe you have some last comments about the challenges from Poland before we take some questions from the floor? Yeah, so maybe let's also talk about uh, the enforcement, which yes. is uh, interesting from the perspective of the recent uh, regulatory changes. Uh, in terms of enforcement, actually, in Poland, uh, looking at it from the perspective of an offshore foreign operator, the, the instruments which the authorities have in their hands are really limited. They are basically limited to blacklisting. And blacklisting, uh, as I don't think this is only a Polish example, I think the same case was in Italy some time ago, it's basically playing hide-and-seek uh, between the uh, operators and the, uh, the regulator. We see the, uh, the, the ministerial register being populated on an almost daily basis by new domains, but when you look at the domains, uh, there are hundreds of them right now, I don't even remember the figure, they are like betting one, betting two, betting three, etc., etc., etc. Well, basically blacklisting works well uh, in a situation like, uh, uh, like a Danish one, when we have on one hand the blacklisting, on the other uh, licensing regime, which actually invites others to, to come rather than to, to, you know, to, um, to breach it. Uh, so in terms of, of uh, enforcement, uh, no challenges will be probably faced by the, uh, by the op operators, but what I think may happen, we may see new market entrants who will be simply enticed by the recent examples, who will decide to go through this uh, complex and uh, time-consuming process of applying for the license just to, just to you know, put its it's, it's foot on, the, on this 40 million uh, players market, which, uh, which I think is opportunity for, for every single uh, market player. Other than that, I don't think it's any challenges will, will be faced until we see some decisions of, of the ECJ. Of course. All right, very well. We have last few minutes. Maybe if we have any comments from the floor. <laughs> James Strickluna, WH Partners. <laughs> <laughs> I, I promise to be concise. <laughs> um, Bar Bartosz, um, in Poland, is what 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 you what you said? Uh, th does that apply? Does that apply to um, crypto casinos? How, how does Polish law look at crypto uh, ca casinos? Yeah, crypto crypto casinos or play, you know, or, or wagering in cryptocurrency. So how, how, I think what's, what's the <laughs> Polish position on that? That's one. There is no uh, position. Mar <laughs> Maria, <laughs> Maria, since, since uh, the licensing process has been sort of slow, six months from law being adopted to, to the cutoff period and arguably not very transparent, if an operator were to continue offering in, in Sweden after the 31st of December, um, what is the risk of enforcement? And Andreas? Um, <laughs> after the first of after the first of December, um, since apparently in, in Switzerland there will only be uh, IP blocking later in the year, and there's no real uh, no real teeth to the legislation, no criminal sanctions. Then again, what is the risk for an operator to continue offering that? Thank you. Should I start? Yeah. Please. Um, so there's no grace period. If you don't have a license by 1st of January 2019, you are not allowed to target the Swedish market anymore. 
Um, I don't know um, if the gambling authority might be a little bit more Lenient. friendly and issue licenses, even though the license applications may not be entirely complete and they may still have questions and include conditions in the license in this respect. But there, there's the, the law doesn't provide for an opportunity to give a grace period, so there will not be. Um, and what will the enforcement be? What are the risks? Well, in, as in many markets, the biggest, well, the biggest or the best way to enforce this is, of course, to rely on uh, other operators who do have a license to make sure that life is difficult for operators who yeah. do not. We then have a payment blocking pr possibility. We have um, uh, PSPs, or sorry, <laughs> ISPs who have to put up a warning sign. So there's no ISP blocking, but they put up a warning sign that um, you're now entering into a domain that doesn't have a Swedish license. But I think that the biggest problem for operators who have applied for a license but will not be able to get it from 1st of January is that if they continue to operate and target Sweden, they are never going to get a license. Andreas? Right. Um, <laughs> we just comment. got a message on the board here that the security <laughs> is going to drag us off stage in any second, so I'll keep it very short. Um, basically, the uh, questions on enforcement on foreign operators which continue to provide services into Switzerland after 1st January is, is open. Um, based on the wording of the law, we are of the opinion there are no enforcement possibilities, so similar as, uh, as in Poland. However, it remains to be seen how, how enforcement agencies actually see that. Uh, but I think the wording of the law should be sufficiently clear. So I hope that this little, little um, Swiss regulators can actually do about that, instead, in s except of the blocking itself. All right, so very well. Yes. Last comment, yes? About the crypto. Yeah, about the crypto. <laughs> so I will be very uh, brief. Uh, James, it's a no. It's a no. <laughs> <laughs> For now, it's a no. The, the crypto, crypto in Poland is, is uh, we are far away from the situation where the Maltese uh, uh, jurisdiction is. So it's it basically a legislative vacuum, which on one hand means challenges for those who want to uh, deal with crypto in Poland. On the other hand, it also means opportunities. So that's, but in gaming, it's a no for now. Very well. All right. Thank you. Thank you, uh, members of the panel. It was a pleasure having you. Thank you. Um, I think we, we have run our time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Gambling tax, VAT, and other necessary evils. Monica Molnar, MME. Frieder Baku, SSW. Schneider Schiffer, <laughs> via Müller. Amandus Jabin, Betson Group. Moderated by Ramona Azzopardi, WH Partners. Good afternoon, everyone, and now it is time to talk about tax. Together with my panelists and specialists, tax specialists from, Swed um, from Sweden, Amandos, but he's also uh, in-house counsel of uh, Betsen, uh, a gaming company, a big gaming company. Monica, a specialist from uh, Switzerland, and Frieda, a tax specialist from Germany, will be speaking about updates of 2018, VAT updates and other taxes in relation to gambling, and also what we're expecting in 2019. So what's new in 2019? From a Maltese perspective, as most of you are aware, there were some changes on the VAT side. Uh, in 2018, Malta introduced VAT on poker and casino. We also introduced VAT grouping 
uh, VET grouping as a mitigation, VET mitigation tool for gaming operators who operate from Malta and who are linked with operational, economic and financial links. And we also um, got an introduction to a guideline which gave more information about the vetable base. And this is, a, in my opinion, a very important guideline which uh, other uh, European member states should follow because, because it gives all the clarity on the VED base. For example, uh, in this guideline, the Maltese government determined what is the VED base. And we concluded that if there is VAT applied to casino, we have to apply VAT on, uh, on GGR. We also uh, defined that GGR is inclusive of the 18% VAT. We also uh, highlighted what should be excluded from the GGR. So, for example, bonuses should be excluded from, from the GGR. And in my opinion, this is a very important, uh, it gives clarity to the VED base. Frida, my first question linked to this is for you. Germany was the very first country to state that it's going to adopt, uh, in 2015, apply VAT. On, on casinos, but there was a big debate on, on the VED base and also what is an electronically supplied service. Three years down the line, now there are audits happening in Germany. What's the situation? Do you have clarity of what's GGR, what is an electronically supplied service now? Well, <laughs> Ramona, thank you. Um, as we have heard from Jörg when he was talking about Germany, um, we do not have a regulation on online casinos, um, so we do not have any specific regulations for, for that by now. It's, it's not regulated as properly as, as here in Malta, with, with guidelines, with directives, with, with detailed opinions. No, we are not having such things uh, by now. So, as we have heard, online casinos are not lawful at present under German formal law. Does this mean that they are not to be taxed? We know the answer, no. <laughs> Our tax authorities, of course, they do not really differ uh, whether the activities of online casinos are legal or not. They want their share. So, when the system changed, the VET system changed in, in the beginning of 2015, there uh, were a number of open questions. And since we do not have regulations for casinos and do not have any guidelines for, for uh, that, the general principles apply for online casinos. So um, there were a number of open questions and when and uh, companies started to file tax returns either here in Malta by using the mini one-stop uh, shop system or directly in Germany at the competent tax authorities in Berlin. And as a consequence of, of this filing, w there are now uh, tax audits uh, which are being performed by the tax, uh, tax authorities of Berlin. And so, despite the fact that we do not have official guidelines, we at least at present have some have information about the view which is taken at present by the tax authorities. So um, let's go into some details, but not too many. First of all, the most decisive decision which was to be taken is the question, what is the calculation base? Is it the stakes? or is it rather GGR uh, or the rake? This question f at first was, was not clear and uh, constituted a very substantial risk for the operators because different from uh, enforcing gaming regulations, it is much easier to enforce taxes within Europe. So, w at first it was unclear, but uh, at a certain point of time, it seems that the tax authorities have come to the uh, decision that the calculation base is not stakes, it's GGR or rake. 
And this is the same approach as here in Malta, and that's the only reasonable approach. The uh, second question, which has also substantial economic uh, or financial impact, is whether VAT is already included mm -hmm. in, in mm -hmm. GGR or in the RIC. And also in this regard, it seems that the authorities follow this approach, following general principles that um, VAT already is included, so that GGR includes 19%. Um, next point also mentioned by you, what about bonus payments? Here we do not have such clear view. In our opinion, in opinion they should uh, be on only uh, be of relevance if, if they are paid out and then, then be deducted. But here we do not have a very clear position on of the authorities. Next point, uh, what about jackpot contributions, which are paid by the operators? Um, here, at present, uh, the authorities do not follow our view. We, we, we share the view that uh, they, these jackpot contributions should be deducted, but they <coughs> don't really want to deduct it, which would have strange consequences. So th these are uh, a, a number of details. And one more very important detail is how are life casinos taxed? Are life casinos electronic services? Because as we remember, uh, the place of supply uh, for electronic services is where the consumer is located. So it is of relevance whether a, a service is an electronic service or not. And here, um, it also seems that the authorities follow the view that life casinos are not electronic services, and therefore the place of supply in this context is not Germany, it's the place uh, where the operator is, is located. So we have some more clarity here, but we are far, still far from having guidelines, binding court decisions, uh, binding opinions. So questions still are open, but we are on a somehow reasonable way in this regard. Thank you, Frida. Um, so what you mentioned about the life casino uh, matches exactly with um, a guideline which was issued by the VET department in 2015. So in 2015, um, the VET department had issued a guideline saying that life casino is not an electronically supplied service. So now we can safely say that if Germany is also considering life casino not as an electronically supplied service. Maltese gambling um, companies, which are established in Malta, can safely uh, deduct the life part from the VAT that they are paying uh, in Germany. Because now it's clear from, from, both, um, from both ends. Yes, it, it seems so. At present, we, we believe that this opinion, that this view will be shared as I said, we don't have clarity in this regard, but it's a reasonable approach also, because um, if, if you look at the European regulations, uh, you have the example of e-learning. E-learning is not deemed mm -hmm. as electronic uh, service, despite the fact that there is no direct interaction. But the decisive difference is this human intervention, and if, if players are choosing to play on a live casino. This is what they want to see. They want to see a human being which is having yes. in inf influence on the outcome of the game. And as long as this is the case, it is correct to say this human intervention, this makes the difference. And therefore, this is not an electronic uh, service. Mm -hmm. Mentioning electronically supplied services, I go now to Monica. Yes. I, I understand that Switzerland has adopted this concept of electronically supplied services way before the European Union did. And my understanding is that a Maltese gambling operator now providing online gambling in Switzerland uh, has to register for VAT in Switzerland. H how is the approach? Is it uh, now it's determined that, that the Maltese gambling operator needs to pay uh, VAT in Switzerland and they have to register in Switzerland. Can you guide us a bit on, on this point? 
Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, first of all, we need to understand, although Switzerland is not an EU member state, we have uh, our own national law, and then we have uh, also uh, the category and the definition for the digital electronic supply of services. If we are talking about uh, gambling services, we need to understand what, what does it mean, what kind of services uh, can we subsume under uh, this, uh, this definition. And then uh, there are two ways, yeah. If we have uh, um, fully tele um, technically provided uh, services, digital services, that this type of um, services lead um, that liability where the recipient is located. If a foreign entity, like the Maltese, Maltese company, mm -hmm. uh, performs electronically digital services to recipient uh, in, uh, located in Switzerland. In this case, uh, the place of supply in Switzerland, the foreign entity will be liable for VAT. However, in the second step, we need to understand do we have a private individuals or do we have a company as a recipient. In this case, um, we have, if uh, the recipient are private individuals, we have uh, um, mandatory uh, registration for foreign entities in Switzerland. Uh, the Swiss VAT law has been changed and we have a new regulation 1st of January uh, 2018 and um, before this regulation we had a threshold uh, about 100,000 Swiss francs. It was a minimum amount uh, to be VAT liable. However, 1st of January 2018 uh, this 100,000 depends of the worldwide turnover, you know, it's not, not, um, so uh, it's not limited to Switzerland, yes, the 100,000, but it's on their worldwide uh, turnover. Yes, and if the foreign entity um, exceeds this type of turnover, they uh, liable for VAT. However, you mentioned in Germany, Frieder, that uh, 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 there are some uh, cases, human interaction, yeah. In the first part, uh, we talk about digital electronically supplied <coughs> services without having any human interaction. In the case, we have also cases uh, when the, there is not only the machine uh, supplies the services, there is also human intervention. Under human in intervention, the Swiss authority means that uh, somebody have a, a right or have a right, has a right uh, to be approached. They can um, have uh, um, call somebody or they can write an email to the service provider. And in these cases, we have uh, the possibility of human intervention. Therefore, we are outside of the category of the digital electronically supplied services. Therefore, uh, no uh, mandatory VAT registration is um, applicable for the foreign uh, supplier. So if you are in the context of a casino, if there's an op uh, a possibility of contacting uh, customer care or some sort of human intervention, it, would that be outside the scope of our electronic uh, digital services? Uh, this interaction uh, needs to be uh, between uh, the recipient and uh, the service provider. And, and this is a practice uh, that is not written in the law, and in uh, some uh, cases uh, we need to demonstrate uh, for the tax authority what, uh, what kind of interaction do we have. You know, it is always the, um, um, the gap how to understand and how to uh, demonstrate this kind of and human approach. How, how would you go about this? So would you ask for a ruling in Switzerland? How, how it's usually tackled with the, with the authorities in Switzerland? Uh, you know, um, uh, the VAT regime is a self-assessed tax. You know, the tax authority will not come to Maltese entity or <coughs> Germany or Sweden. Please uh, come to us because you perform services which are taxable. Uh, in Switzerland, and we need your your money um, to defend your position. It is al always our recommendation uh, that you need to collect all ta type of information to uh, to achieve uh, to be outside of the digital electronically performed services categories. That means 
you need to demonstrate that, yes, the client, res respectively the recipient, can call us. The client can send us an email. Uh, the interaction, there is a possibility for the interaction between uh, the private individuals and uh, the service uh, provider. It's interesting that you link it to the possibility of human interaction, not the actual yeah. Yeah. service. Would, yeah. would that really be uh, sufficient to have an, a hotline and uh, some exactly. uh, customer support? Yes, it's enough. You know, that the would not be enough in Germany. Yeah, but, you know, <laughs> in Switzerland, the tax authority uh, doesn't ask you, uh, is your hotline services work? Yeah, how yes. does it work? You know, but there's the if possibility. Have, yeah. So if there's a possibility, you're yeah. outside. Outside. Yeah. Well. Interesting. Well, yeah, how does it work? It's outside of the um, um, a scope of the tax authority. They cannot prove technically and they cannot make a quality con control for your uh -huh. hotline services. And in the case there's a VAT liability, uh, again, focusing on a Maltese uh, gaming supplier, they need to register for VAT in Switzerland. Do they need to have someone present in Switzerland? How does it work? And in, from an input VAT point of view, would they be able to recover expenses yes. that they incur in Switzerland? Yeah. If they follow under the category digital services and the ma they have a mandatory uh, VAT registration, uh, they need to have uh, 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 two things. Uh, they need to appoint uh, a fiscal representative. It can be everybody. It can be me or other or the advisor, or the um, private individuals. And the most important thing, they need to have a deposit. Yeah, uh, they need to, um, uh, the tax authority want to make sure that a potential not paid VAT are uh, deposited uh, within a Swiss bank. Yeah, the minimum uh, uh, amount of the deposit is 2,000 Swiss, uh, Swiss francs. The maximum amount of the deposit is uh, 250,000 uh, Swiss francs. This and how do you determine how much you need to deposit? Is it taken on? previous uh, VAT returns, basis, or...? Um, uh, your, your expected turnover for the next year. Oh. This is the base value. However, um, uh, some cases there are also um, a p um, possibility to negotiate the tax authority. It is not only and always uh, the 2,000 and it's not a 200, uh, 250,000. You know, in Switzerland all the times, and then I recommend uh, the client, uh, you need to communicate and negotiate, uh, negotiate with the tax authority because if you are not in it, that's mean, if you are not <coughs> looking for the dialogue with the tax authority, you cannot uh, win it, you know? <laughs> There's always, I, I give you, I receive, and then if, the, if they um, realize that there is an interaction, then you are, you are lucky. Yeah. S sounds good <laughs> <laughs> to have this opportunity. It sounds good, but there are lots of things to keep in mind, especially this, that the money is blocked there for, for yeah. how many, for, is it for every quarter or for a year? Um, uh, this uh, money is blocked until you are registered uh, in the Swiss VAT register. Interesting. Amandus, <laughs> with all these changes, how do you manage to keep up? <laughs> you as a tax advisor of a local gambling uh, company I, I, in Malta. I, I feel humbled sitting here next to these guys. These, know what, these guys know what they're talking about. <laughs> um, from my angle, I mean, all of these things are, are super important, the, the details of it. But what I normally more work with is the question of, how are we evolving things? And, and as you heard previous panels talk about, there's new legislation coming up all the time. It's, yeah. It is crazy times right now. Um, Sweden is the, the first one we see on the, the horizon. And basically my job is to try and foresee what effects this will have. Yeah. So I need, I need to, to talk to people like Frida and, uh, and Monica all the time to, in order to understand where, where are the, the small steps that are taken locally um, heading? Because you need to understand the different cultures of the different um, authorities, tax authorities, and, and the, the politics behind what the new legislation is trying to achieve okay. in order to understand where are we actually heading with this. And to me, this is, I mean, it's, if you don't like taxes, it's, you would go <laughs> crazy in this world. Oh. Um, so. <laughs> It, it is, 
to me, I, I'm kind of I'm kind of glad. It sounds like I haven't got much experience from from Switzerland, but uh, Switzerland sounds like a, a fairly clear country on what 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 the law expects from you. I have a little bit more experience with with the German uh, situation, and it's the absolute opposite there for me. Yes, uh, there is not so much. Uh, the clarity is is hard to to grasp, if you put it that way. Yeah. Um, we, I, 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 I mean, we walked through the the questions that that you talked about the whether the the for anyone working in the industry the absurd idea of using turnover as your VAT tax base, mm. which would kill the business for for almost all companies. A profit margin of five percent, nineteen percent taxes. <laughs> it's That's hard not, to work around good, that good part. Deal, yes. yes. <laughs> but but moving forward and and having that sort of clarity at such a late stage and ha having to be forced to live in a, a sort of a legal vacuum it, it, it's always it, it's hard to to um to 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 see where we're actually and to heading plan. and to plan and to be able to express to your in our case investors yes. what's actually happening what are good environments to to look into for the future and that's why i think it's so important for for um, jurisdictions that are regulated mm. to be clear and, and to have a timeline which is, um, has a little bit of a horizon to it. Yes, we want the regulation to come as soon as possible, but we also want to be in a position where we can adjust to the changes that are coming to understand and build the organizations that are required to, to, to fulfill the requirements that will be set. So I think from... Uh, um, I have great hopes for <laughs> Germany. <laughs> um, I think ch things will change. I am certain that it will have to change. Uh, I think it's in the best interest for, for all the gaming companies. I think it's in the best interest for the, the, the state. Um, and I'm hoping all the lenders will find a common ground. W w well, uh, <laughs> I'm, I have been hoping this for 15 years now. Uh, um, <laughs> we we will see. Die. But but on the other hand, at least tax-wise, our the the worst expectations have not uh, turned to be true. So yes. so especially especially this uh, this one question: What is the calculation base? It seems that they now have a reasonable approach. Mm -hmm. And despite the fact that online games, uh, online casinos are completely un unlawful, we are discussing about detail details <laughs> of. Uh, Mm -hmm. How how they are to be taxed? Okay. It, it's a very absurd uh, situation. <laughs> Tax authorities they do not care. They want they as I said they want their money, and and uh, discuss about details despite the fact that it's completely unlawful. Mm -hmm. But it's a, that's it's a the way it world. is. Yes. The Tax authorities don't care. Yeah. <laughs> yes, they just want the money, even though it's illegal. But. They want what's sold to them. One last question to all of you. What's happening in the future? What are we expecting? This concept of digital tax, does it worry you? What's your take on this? I, I mean, it was proposed by the OECD, the EU followed. We know that there are some countries that you, they're implementing it unilaterally. What's your take on this? Uh, Amandus, I don't know whether you want to go I first. If, if I go first then. Uh, well, I, I think the... I think it's inevitable that OECD will have a, a position on this. I think it, for, 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 from certain points, it's at least it's understandable why there needs to be some changes due to the ease of, of, of shifting profits. That said, I think the OECD version of slowly trying to find a common ground, coming up with an idea that is applicable to everyone, is the only way. The EU version, which is an interim solution, which will try and solve this problem in the meantime, it, it will not work. Um, hopefully, a lot of countries will, will be understanding that and, and will be working against it. I know that a lot of the Nordic countries are against digital taxation. Yeah. Um, I think France is very much for it. Germany, we're hoping, uh, have the sense to, uh, to, to not back it, but we don't know yet. It and and most likely we'll see what the end result is in ECOFIN in December. So, well, Germany of course is uh, not too positive with with this idea because it it could le lead to lower tax revenues for for Germany since 
there is a lot of production in Germany, whereas the products which are being, being produced are, are used somewhere else, so the, the consumption is somewhere else, and this, at the end of the day, this could really lead to lower taxes. This is why Germany might not be uh, the best friend of this uh, idea, but in the long run, we need, we need a change. I personally think that this change will not happen too soon, and since there ha has been times when the countries, uh, federal states of, uh, when the states of, of Europe have, have been cooperating in a better way, I, I, I think this will still take a substantial mm. time Fantastic. until we have respective uh, changes which really apply for all European countries. Mm. Monica and Switzerland, what's yeah, the the s in, in Switzerland is the same, you know, uh, we are not part of the EU. Uh, you are always monitor the developments, you know, we will, we are the first pioneers in, in crypto and uh, blockchain uh, technologies, but somehow if we are talking about taxation, it it can be uh, difficult, yeah. But the tendency is that... To wait and see. Yeah. <laughs> let's okay. not so wait let's see. wait and see what's <laughs> going to happen on the digital uh, tax. Aspect. I want the absolute opposite. <laughs> 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 not I don't know if there are any questions from the floor. Okay, I think we're done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for listening. Sell, list, leverage. Christian Tirabasi. Ficom Leisure. Jason Fisher. Wigan. Tal Itzakron. Tal Ron Driechem and Co. Nicholas Aquilina. Brandel and Talos Rexam Velter. Moderated by James Shikluna, WH Partners. Hello everybody, and those of you who are still here and who are fighting the pains of hunger, resisting uh, the temptation to go and have a snack, <coughs> to listen to what this extremely qualified panel of speakers have to say. Thank you for joining us. Um, so let's immediately get, get to the <coughs> point, right? Most, most people found the business hoping to make a killing someday, don't they? Most people found a business hoping they're going to make a lot of money through the growth of the business yep. and through dividends paid to themselves. But they do hope someday, normally, to exit. And routes for exit, as you know, are through private sale. They could be through uh, listing a company and equity listing, perhaps. And in the course of that development of a business, most people <coughs> would probably want to secure additional funding. So they might leverage, they might borrow. Um, and this is what we're here to talk about today. The market has evolved quite a lot in this industry. We've seen, uh, we've seen it progress on the M&A side from smaller deals to now some very large private equity groups coming in. We've seen the large players grow even larger through acquisitive processes. Um, and let me kick this off by asking Christian. Christian, you are an M&A advisor. You put deals together. <coughs> How have you seen the market evolve? the last five to ten years, and where you can mention names, because I think it's always more interesting for people to be able to relate to specific deals. I'll try, I'll try. So first of all, I would like to reassure the, the, the audience that, yes, there is still the opportunity to make a lot of money. And the reason being that uh, we are in a phase of this industry that's still going through consolidation. It's a young industry. I've been, I've been in this industry since 96. It sounds like a couple of centuries ago, but uh, you know, it's still a very young industry. So what we've been, uh, you know, what, what we see in the market is definitely a dynamic of consolidation, as everybody can see. But this dynamic of consolidation is basically the effect of two me mega driver. One is uh, a vertical 
uh, integration where you know the operator want to integrate with product and product uh, the suppliers and so on so there is a, a, an acquisition a vertical acquisition so everybody that develop new games develop new solution payment you know being innovative obviously is a target for for a consolidation and acquisition the other <coughs> the other driver that we see which obviously generate deals in in many cases is the horizontal integration. So somebody, a few years ago, somebody who was in the lottery industry or was betting was not necessarily looking at other gaming products. Say, you know, I'm a betting guy, uh, you know, casinos are not really my, my environment. Yeah. So obviously that has changed dramatically where now the large company or every company is trying to be as wide as possible in order to give to the customers, to the player, a very wide offering. Uh, <coughs> <clears throat> of, of games. Does that, does that also apply to this horizontal expansion? You, you're talking about product-wise, product expansion, but does, does that also apply in your experience to geography? And is it also a result, perhaps, of regulation? Absolutely. And this, again, the, we are in a, in, a, in a regulated environment, so we have to look at regulation by <coughs> regulation. So you have to adapt in regu the regulation uh, and adapt your strategy based on what the regulation allow you. So you are a land-based guys, you have opportunity to invest in online, you are an online, maybe in some specific jurisdiction you need to invest land-based even though it's not in your, mm. in your DNA. So again, all this dynamic generate deals. Deals at small level where a big company buy <coughs> a small particular company that have a specific position or at the high level where two large companies go together in order to be even bigger and to cover a number of... Uh, of market and uh, uh, product. So, so you, say, you say there's still money to be made, and you say you can buy companies at a small level. I, I mean, you, probably you're referring to scenarios where there's new product, new technology, or vertical integration, as you said, with payment providers. But are you seeing sort of small companies by other smaller companies, or new entrants to the market as investors by small companies? Uh, is there still the opportunity to make money at that, that level? So, so is the, it, it's not true then that essentially this has just become a big boys game. Well, uh, it, it depends on the, the time span that we look at. Definitely now there is still a lot of consolidation also at the, at the lower level where, you know, small companies are, are trying to enter new market and maybe they, they, they buy a small operation to enter that new market. We are a big believer of that kind of strategy where we believe the right way to get in, the, in a new jurisdiction or in a different jurisdiction is to go through an acquisition of something there that you can grow, where you can bring expertise and so on. Uh, the, the other element is that the, the, the majority of the deal that we see are strategic investors. <coughs> so there is a, a small part of uh, fi pure financial investor, even a smaller part of debt over equity, uh, on the medium lower side of the spectrum. Obviously, when you go to the larger deal, then it becomes, you know, typical m and &A, a material where you have, uh, you know, the typical debt element, even though much less than in other, in other segment, as well as, uh, as uh, private equity fund being, being, uh, being involved. Are you seeing much of private debt being put into companies in, in, in this sector? Not as it should be. Like, uh, this, is, uh, this is by definition a cash-rich uh, sector. And uh, so the debt should be very comfortable, but for a number of reasons, which are not financial or economical reasons, yeah. uh, many, many debt providers are not looking enough into this, uh, into this uh, segment. We see a little bit more, on obviously, on the larger deal or, or bond structure or, uh, you know, leverage finance, but uh, very little, almost none at the medium-lower part of the spectrum. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to keep hammering you with questions for now because I'm really interested in, 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 the, in this line that you're taking. I, is, that, is that, you think, because people, let's say, uh, potential lenders have not yet got comfortable with the industry or will, perhaps they can never get comfortable with the industry by its nature? Uh, or is it that they're, they're, not used, they're not used to it? Perhaps regulation is something completely new. How, how, how would you explain it? Uh, actually, these are the two reasons. One is that certain, certain institutions cannot touch the sector by some decision taken at a very high level. So we don't do gaming full stop. There is no conversation. The other one is they don't invest in, uh, in research enough. So they don't understand the sector. Uh, they, 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 they really don't, don't, don't study it enough in order to be comfortable as they are comfortable in order 
maybe much more difficult market in terms of debt. Um, so it's, it's a matter of, uh, of be, uh, being exposed to it and uh, uh, obviously um, bringing and developing expertise. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Tal, can I turn to you? Of course. Um, obviously, one of, one of the key points in, if we're talking about m and if we're talking even about you know, issuing debt um, instruments, uh, if we're talking about leveraging of any sort, really, is, is estimating the value of the business, apart from cash flow considerations and such. Uh, uh, so you have a lot of experience doing deals in the sector. You, you have a lot of experience advising investors coming into it. So can you talk to us a little bit about sort of valuation parameters that are being seen sure. in this business? Thank, thank you. And, and also congratulations for yesterday for once again, for WH Partners, cho chosen as the leading I Thank you very much. I think the congratulations goes to our fantastic for the team. gaming Amazing. and gambling team. Amazing team. And I have good experience of working with your team, and thanks again. So valuation is a key point. You started the, 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 the panel with, with issue. Yeah, many of the people here, I don't know if it's all of us here on stage, the same, share the same feeling, but many in this business are for the exit, are for, for killing it, as you said. And uh, valuation is a key issue. And we can take some, some kind of, uh, let's say, examples, some of them we've been involved with, and see how it turns around the time with, with the, the, the emphasis of regulation. It's exactly very similar to what you said now. And uh, if we take, like, uh, Pleitica. Pleitica was several years ago established by, by Israeli guys. I'm from Tel Aviv. So 15 people sold their company for $90 million dollars or 90 million euros, it was for, for, to Caesars Entertainment. And Caesars Entertainment, a large uh, company based in the States, has lots of land-based casinos, lots of entertainment, Britney Spears shows, and everybody in Israel and Tel Aviv in the ecosystem opened their eyes, said, what's happening here? 90 million dollars for 15 people? This is a very absurd valuation. You the, said 90, right? 90. 90. 90. Nine zero. Na, nine zero, exactly, yeah. sorry, nine zero. Which is already, you know, a reasonable number, I suppose. It's a very nice number. Yeah. It's an amazing number. Ninety, nine zero million dollars for 15 employees for, for, for a company which wasn't that successful at the time. They had an idea, social gaming. This is what they did, social gaming. That was a great buzzword, I'm sure, James. And you, you wrote a book on social gaming. I have it <laughs> with, with, with a cartoon on the cover. You're an expert on social gaming. A couple gaming. of years ago. Yeah. A couple of years ago, when it was the big thing. And everybody in Tel Aviv opened their eyes and said, this valuation is hilarious. How come these Americans pay for, for uh, these Israelis $90 million for, for 15 employees? But w guess what? One and a half years ago, that company was sold again to a Chinese conglomerate called Giant for $4 billion. $4 billion, the same company. Now, yes, it had more employees, it had more offerings, but $4 billion. That's my point. The valuation is only in the eyes of, of, of the guys who are having a look at the deal. And, and it can start with something that looks very peculiar. How come you pay 90 million? And then the guys who bought for 90 million bought, sell it for 4 billion. So it all depends. And, and the regulation and the ecosystem is all has dependency. We can see it in play tech shares that goes up and down with, with what's going on in Asia. We, we see it all the time. But let's stick, let's stick to this point of valuation, right? Because you say it's all in the eyes of the person who wants that particular thing. So somebody who wants something desperately, right? Exactly. Is going to pay a desperate man's price. Exactly. But most investors are not like that, right? Most investors are going to look at what the basis, what the, what the market standards are. Um, and, and of course, there are differences in valuation between an asset that has extremely strong IP. Play Tech has, of course, a case in point because it was the IP. It was the new product coming to the market. Um, it was the mass market type, uh, type product. And a lot of other businesses uh, might not have IP as strong. Exactly. Um, or they may, but certainly, you know, valuations at these levels uh, rarely are only justified on the basis of the IP. There has to be the cash flow to, to match it. Exactly. It can be either of an IP, which can be very interesting, but as you said, James, we all, we all deal with IP and, and gaming companies. Many of these gaming companies doesn't have an IP. They're a cash cow. They know they have good affiliates, they have a good sales team, they have a good product, they're interesting, but they don't have an IP. But they know how to generate cash. So based on that cash cow, 
people can say, listen, we want to pay this. On my experience, it's not all, 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 always a point. It's exactly what you just said now. Uh, and, and someone can be very desperate to have this in this off offering. Maybe it's your competitor. Maybe you want to have this next big thing. Maybe you're now thinking that the regulation in Sweden will be the next big thing and we need to, to focus. And you know, it, it, another example, the, the guys from Ask Gamblers, we, we see them all, 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 all the place. You know, when they, they were purchased a few years ago for 7 million euro, everybody said, come on, to buy, to buy this site for 7 million euro and these guys okay. from Serbia. Okay, guys, okay. So, so, so Tal and Christian. Give me some multiples, right, yeah. that you are seeing in the industry, some ranges. Let's say, let's say, okay, let's say regulated business, strictly regulated, online only. Multiples. Christian. Regulated, online only. Yeah. Between uh, 6 and 10. Between 6 and 10. Yeah. Okay. And I tell you why my, 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 it's so wide, because, uh, you know, you have to look at... Uh, specific market. So Definitely. unfortunately, some market, even though they're regulated, they're more on the six. Some others, since there is a huge upside in the front, people are pay, ready to pay a higher multiple. Okay. Combined, regulated and gray, online only. It's a different to, to, to find a buyer, first of all, because uh, the one that's going to buy regulated will not just discount the, the, the gray market, but in many cases, they don't want it. So you've seen many deals in the past yeah. where they asked to split the company exactly. before acquiring. To whitewash it, they to whitewash it, to launder it. <laughs> well, uh, <They> will. <laughs> perhaps, not, no. perhaps to reduce yes. risk. <laughs> so they were ready to pay the full multiple on the, on the, on the regulated side, but they really said, oh, you know, I cannot touch certain countries. So the mix is really difficult, is really difficult. Also on the B2B, and eh? not just on the B2C, also on the B2B. So uh, supplier, technology supplier that are exposed to certain market, they suffer a discount uh, in the best of the cases. Tal. This is a discussion I, I would love to continue, but you know, the time is limited, and I really want to jump onto some other topics to discuss here. Uh, when, <coughs> when, when looking at businesses in the sector, Nicholas, I'll, 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 I'll ask this question to you. When looking at businesses in the sector, um, again, whether it is due diligence prior to a listing, to a public debt issue, or in an M&A context, there are some very, very specific variables that you need to consider from a due diligence point of view. Can you talk to us about this? Sure, yeah. Uh, <coughs> so I think the, the key area, of course, is always regulation, right? Because the uh, legal position, the legal environment a company is operating in is, is key to ensure business continuity in these uh, cases. So um, any buyer will want to be certain about the regulatory position of a company that they are to acquire on the same uh, page, of course, um, you know, also if you look at the merger of equals, very often there is reverse due diligence done as well. Yeah, the question is what is actually the, the regulatory rationale behind the deal? Uh, we've heard diversification, diversification of <coughs> products, you know, does, a, does an online company want to uh, go into the land-based sector? Does a sports betting company want to uh, um, go into the casino sector? So all these issues will also be looked into at due diligence. Um, diversification by geography, yeah? are we looking at purely licensed businesses, are we looking at uh, businesses operating in what us gambling lawyers often refer to as the grey market, um, what revenues are coming into the uh, industry. So um, depending on the, let me call it the regulatory rationale behind the deal, that will also be reflected in the due diligence work. Now. It's, it's pretty certain that the first thing in a gaming DD you will be looking at is the licenses, the licensing status. And that sounds pretty easy, that sounds pretty straightforward, you know, just scroll through the documents, scroll through the licenses you'll find in a data room. Unfortunately, that's very often not the case, because very often you'll be uh, confronted with looking at jurisdictions where there will just be no license in the data room, yeah? Um, and that is not because the operator was not, uh, you know, willing or capable to obtain that license, but that is because we have regulatory uncertainty, legal uncertainty in, in many even large and established jurisdictions. Okay. Um, I can speak of Austria, my home jurisdiction, yeah, where, for instance, there is no uh, licensing for online sports betting in place, which does not mean that, uh, you know, an operator doing business in Austria is an illegal operator, far from it, yeah, but you won't find that license document in the data room. So the question very often will be, what is your legal position? Yeah, so 
gaming due diligence very often is more than reviewing documents, summarizing documents, forming a position based on documentation, but actually looking one step further, what is the legal basis of operations in certain markets? And of course, it's easier for uh, regulated markets, um, depending on whether it's online or offline, you know, be beyond the main license documents, you may be uh, reviewing premises licenses as well, which again leads to many further topics like are they still valid, what do the rental agreements look like, uh, or what is the, the basis of the real estate, there are many topics linked to that. Um, whereas if it is an unlicensed uh, jurisdiction, a grey market, um, you will really need to look into uh, the legal basis for the operations there, probably question the other side's counsel, um, what's the legal basis for your operations, do you have valid legal arguments to be operating in that market? And that analysis, uh, that analysis uh, should be, therefore, what is the legal basis, and that legal basis, it's not simply whether you have a license or not, or whether you're allowed to operate or not, it's actually an analysis of a legal basis by product, by product by market, or by market by product. So in every relevant market, you have to assess what the legal basis is for you offering every single product. Exactly, right? every single product, every distribution channel, um, and of course, you know, sometimes even look at Austria, we have nine federal states, look at Germany, we have 16 federal states there. Um, also, by local geography within one country, within one jurisdiction. Uh, Germany, for instance, yes, yeah, as, as many of you will be aware, there is a licensing regime in place in Schleswig-Holstein, yeah, or a transitional regime uh, for sports betting now uh, having been put in place in Schleswig-Holstein. So again, my regulatory position may be different when I look at Schleswig-Holstein than when I look at many other jurisdictions or in Austria um, by product. Because in Austria, for instance, sports betting is not considered a game of chance. Again, that'll be different in other, in other jurisdictions, right? Austria is a, a specific point there. Um, so that regulatory, that licensing issue when we, when we talk about due diligence is key, and it very often is more complex than you would think at the, at the very beginning. What other, areas, Nicholas, work. what other areas do you think are, are fundamental to look at in the, the, the course of a due diligence exercise in this industry? So definitely uh, supplier contracts. Yeah, what, what, do your, what do your suppliers look like? What are the, you know, what activities, what supply, what products have you outsourced? Yeah, um, and uh, what's the position of, of those contracts within the company? Are, can you transfer them if the company is, for instance, sold, if the com uh, company is merged? Um, and in, in that regard, of course, very key also IP. IP rights and the access of a company to IP. Yeah, are you allowed to use that IP, for instance, also in jurisdictions? Again, going back to the regulatory point of view, um, where maybe there is no license in place. Yeah, are your suppliers, are your suppliers comfortable with continuing to to service a business that may be more diverse, also from a geographical standpoint, more diverse uh, after a transaction than before? So all of that needs to be factored in already at the beginning. And of course, uh, another key area, I suppose, would be tax. There was a, a whole panel before us dedicated yeah. to tax, and uh, they, they spoke extensively about VAT, which in, in our industry, in the gaming industry, is actually quite quite a, uh, a tricky, um, a tricky area, and, and, and particular attention has to be paid to the the tax structures in place to the way in which companies seek to plan, seek to structure um, their VAT exposure, um, to the reporting obligations and whether they have been fulfilled. Definitely. Um, uh, talking about tax, also gambling tax, is it not? Uh, in Austria, uh, although you don't have licenses for online gaming specifically, um, the state does require operators that take business there, if I'm not mistaken, to pay tax. Correct. Yeah, very similar to Germany. So we have a point of consumption tax that is, as, as you correctly said, not linked to the license. Um, so you have to pay tax for your business that you take from Austria, um, even though you don't have a license in that jurisdiction. And then again, uh, sports betting tax is different from casino tax. Um, in Austria, we do have a, a casino tax based on GGR. That is a specific point of consumption tax in the gambling law. Germany, on the other hand, you have, and, and we heard Frieda on the, on the earlier panel talk about that at length, um, you've got VAT uh, obligation for your, for your German casino revenues.
Yeah, and then there's always the question that also has been discussed. Um, what is an electronically supplied service? How do you qualify uh, live casino games, for instance, where there is human intervention? Of course, the result of, uh, of all this, this due diligence exercise that people like us mm. get involved with and conduct on, 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 on target groups or sometimes even on clients, depending on what, what the nature of the instruction is, results in, in an output, right? In an output which is contractual, which may have an impact on the deal structure. Um, Jason, you, you've been an M&A lawyer for, for several, several years now. You've seen all sorts of deals. But with particular reference to this industry, what, what type of deals are you seeing structure-wise? Yeah, I mean, across the board, there's a, it's still a buoyant market. There's a lot of activity. Obviously, at the listed level, the, the deal structures are pretty straightforward. It's either going to be consolidation, merger, or takeover. Um, most recently, we've seen uh, William Hill with their offer for Mr. Green. Mm -hmm. And I think, well, I think what's really important is the nature of the, and the deal structure is driven by the strategy and the nature of the purchaser. So if we take, uh, for example, the need to diversify your portfolio of revenues, and operators are looking to essentially recalibrate their risk based on regulated or unregulated markets. And it's, it's not actually the same for everyone. So. GVC, for example, are looking far more focused on regulated market activity to what they have done historically. Then you take um, uh, the play that William Hill have made with Mr. Green, and you'd say they've got a vast UK empire, effectively, in terms of their, their stronghold in the UK market, but now they're looking to Mr. Green for other sources of revenue. And so for, the, for that structure, it's quite simply a straight acquisition. Um, and then as far as as far as the differences and also the protections that key off the back of them uh, depend on, the, on, on how people are approaching it. So the US, um, you know, other than Paddy Power Betfair, which is an exception with FanDuel, what we've really seen is, is commercial strategic plays where the approach is one that's more collaborative rather than, um, uh, I suppose, putting all your skin in the game and therefore having to rely on the typical protections you would have in a full M&A scenario. So we've got these commercial joint ventures, but even then, whether it's um, uh, 365 and, and, uh, uh, and Hard Rock or GVC, MGM, and, and most recently William Hill um, uh, with Eldorado, even then we're seeing an element of paper coming in where Eldorado are actually taking a piece of William Hill's US business. So, so the, the, the structures are, are being led by the strategy. Um, and then off the back of that, you, you have your, your, your private equity venture capitalist institutional investor who we're seeing arguably looking at the industry more because it's, it's a high growth industry. The, the prospect of a, uh, a significant and rapid return is, is something that's obviously attractive. And some would say that PASPA being repealed has probably supported that. Um, but, but they're coming in from a slightly different angle, and therefore the protections they will want be slightly different. Typically, you know, they'll take a controlling, a controlling interest. Management will roll over. They'll be incentivized through some form of uh, option scheme or incentive plan. Um, and that's when you kind of say, OK, well, you've got all these different structures. But surely when people are coming to it, they need to bear in mind the same things. And they do, and different people with different levels of experience will have um, uh, a different level of understanding when it comes to things like the regulatory, the change of control. So if you think about, and this is just the UK as an example, if you're going into that market, particularly if the regulator doesn't know you and you're not already a license holder, then you're going to have to go through probity of some sort. And it's not a straightforward process. We're often seeing up to the full 12 weeks that it takes. And in the meantime, you're trying to run a transaction. So if you don't kick that off really early on in the transaction, that can be incredibly disruptive to the deal. And it might even derail it, because everyone knows this industry is incredibly fast moving. And that's a very, it's a, yeah. it's a very interesting point you make. So you, 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 in, a, in a deal context, you're normally signing or exchanging, yep. and you've got a number of conditions precedent, particularly yep. in regulated markets like this. So yep. you, you can have regulatory clients from a gambling point of view, merger control, etc. So what you're saying is absolutely don't wait for signature practically. You should already start the process for before sure. if you're trying to compress the time between exchange and completion. Yeah. I think, I think it's critical. There's also the issue of the MAC, of the material adverse effect. Correct. That can be very interesting in deals that you describe. Yeah. And let's say there is now 
someone who got an eight million pound fine from the gambling commission, or let's say one of the regulators decided that from now on he's enforcing his and sending his long arm uh, uh, to, to people in the Balkans. Okay, this is something that can be a game changer if it's an affiliate business, if it's in a gaming business. It depends. Yeah, I, 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 I want right. to press Jason a bit on this, but if, you, if you're starting, are, are you or are you not saying that you should potentially start approaching a regulator before you sign? Yeah, uh, depending on the context. I mean, and it depends on the regulator as well. C certainly, certainly in the UK, there is the ability to do that. Um, you know, confidentiality is maintained. And it, it's kind of critical to the process that they understand the deal structure. So in the, in the UK, we have a, the concept of a minded consent um, change of control notification process, um, which uh, a lot of people will be familiar with. But uh, I think it's not always the case. Sometimes, as I say, if you're an operator and you already have a license, you may actually take the view, depending on the nature of the business you're acquiring, that the regulator is going to have no issue with me uh, acquiring this business, and I don't need to go for any prior formal or informal consent. So, so it, it's, it's led by the nature of the buyer. But where, where it's going to take significant time, then you may well want to contemplate approaching them in advance, rather than incurring, remember, M&A is not a cheap process to go through. Well, and so of course, the larger yeah. the stakes, excuse the pun, the more important it is to have certainty about regulatory approval. Yeah, for sure. And that's why it's split exchange and completion. We have about three minutes, minutes sure. left, and the clock's turned red now. So <laughs> a couple of questions to all of you. Then perhaps we can have one or two questions from the floor, if there are any. Um, so in terms of translating what we talked about earlier, valuation into contractual terms, yep. right? Are, are, are you seeing things like logged box? But perhaps yep. you want to explain what that is as well to, yeah, to, to yeah, the I audience? Mean, I mean, traditionally, obviously, you have two mechanisms for... Uh, determining whether or not basically the price that you're paying for a business um, is representative of, of, of the balance sheet that you're acquiring. And one of those will be um, the lockbox mechanism. And, and that's probably less familiar, generally, where you effectively strike a date, say we're in November now, so I, I don't know, um, end of September, end of October, you, you strike a balance sheet date. And, and whether or not someone's willing to go through a lockbox process uh, is dependent potentially on bargaining position, but also time scale. So, um, as, a, as a purchaser, you will be saying, okay, a lockbox means I take the benefit, but I also assume the risk post balance sheet date, and I have no ability to step back in and say, if it doesn't actually look like this, uh, barring money leaking out the back door to shareholders because they're taking cash out of the business and putting it into their own pockets when they shouldn't be, barring that, I have no ability. So really what that means is you've got to do your diligence up front uh, you need to understand and get under the skin of the financials, um, and you have to accept that, that there is some risk associated with that. So it is a more seller-friendly mechanic, but we are seeing it, and particularly you know, in auction processes, you may see a seller insisting on going through a locked box route because it gives price certainty. Um, completion accounts, on the other hand, are probably the more tried and tested method. Usually there isn't the time to run a full locked box diligence process on a balance sheet. People get broadly comfortable and say, okay, now stand behind your working capital number, your net asset figure. This is what you've said it is. We think it's broadly right. We're going to run a test post-completion, effectively a post-completion audit of sorts, with one side preparing the accounts, the other side reviewing them. And then if it turns out to not be the, uh, quite what was there, or it's better or worse, there may be um, a price increase, or more often, uh, a price, uh, uh, effectively a post-completion price chip to uh, better reflect the value you've paid. D does anybody else want to s say, say anything on this, on the sort of completion mechanics, mechanisms? Uh, the next question then, and perhaps this is the last one I will be making, is why, uh, we spoke a little bit about sort of private debt. Why aren't we seeing more public bonds? Why aren't we seeing more, 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 more debt financing on the capital markets in this industry? We, we believe that there is uh, uh, the, the higher spectrum of the deal for sure that's going to be an increase in the bonds because, you know, the, the fundamental of what the bond holder and, uh, and the bond structure are looking for are in these companies, whatever is B2B, B2C, depending on the regulation. Um, again, the point is that the expertise of the institution is very limited. So there are just few uh, which are kind of doing the few bonds that are in the market and they're always the same because, again, it's not an area where new institutions are getting or are studying in terms of to get an expertise. Time is up. Um, are there any questions from the audience? I can't see any hands raised. So thank you very much to our thank distinguished you. panelists. Thank you for joining yeah. us.
thank and thank you, you for attending this session. Thank you. What does the future hold for a Pan-African regulation? With reforms in Kenya and Tanzania and remote gambling progression in many sub-Saharan jurisdictions, the need for creating regulation that is both domestically beneficial and internationally attractive is high. Yahaya Maikori, Law Alliance. Ivan Kamileri, Kamil Mac Services. Dr. Hans Wolfram Kessler. Our goal, moderated by John Kamara, Global Gaming Africa. Help for ourselves. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to the African Regulatory Forum, where we'll try to talk a little bit about regulation in Africa with some of the experts here um, who all have either been or lived in Africa at some point. So the kickoff, first, you know, I want to start with um, what we would call one of the most um, 
interest in an addictive gaming lawyer in Africa, Yaya Mekori. Yeah, yeah, I mean, first of all, can you debrief the myth that African countries do not have regulation or there's no regulation in Africa for European operators who are looking to come into the continent? Yeah, thank you, uh, John. Uh, again, it all depends on the, the kind of operators we're talking about. Um, if you're talking about the blue chip operators, obviously, um, comparing where they're coming from or where they're licensed or their primary places of business, they most likely be inclined to thinking that uh, the regulation in Africa is non-existent, you know? And if it's for adventurous entrepreneurs who are looking for opportunities to uh, actually get into the industry, again, the African market is a fair market for them. Um, but having said that, we need to understand that um, regulation is always a process, you know. Uh, it's a process uh, that always and almost always is behind technology, always trying to catch up with technology. So um, if you look at all the key markets that matter, you find out that a lot has been done in terms of regulation. There's actually a primary legislation. And what we're dealing with here now is how to build on that legislation. <coughs> and of course, like I said at the previous, uh, another pa earlier panel, uh, regulation will basically follow the most important games. So you're not going to have a holistic uh, regulation that covers basically uh, uh, sports betting, lottery, casino. Most regulators will work towards the predominant uh, game in their, uh, in their, in their jurisdiction. So. If you're not in sports betting, you wouldn't really be inclined towards uh, a market like Morocco, which is not really a sports betting inclined market. It's more of a poker, uh, casino inclined market, you know. So at the end of the day, what matters most is for you to understand the where you're heading to, the market, understand what's predominant in the market, and then that will give you an opportunity to understand what regulations basically guide that market. Okay. Um so let's kind of dive deep then with Ivan, who is actually an operator in a country like Nigeria. I mean, can you, you know, talk to us a little bit about how you've seen the reg regulatory landscape, how you've been able to navigate it, and what are the challenges that you face as a European operator actually operated in Africa, in Nigeria? Well, we, we entered Africa, um, Nigeria, in fact, Lagos, to be more exact, in 72. So we've been in in uh, the Nigerian market since, since 1972, where there was, in fact, a license. Uh, it was what we would be calling a, a regulated market. We, we had to have a license in order to operate slot machines over there. Since then, um, Nigeria has uh, developed into a uh, sports betting market, predominantly, missing out slot machines completely. but only um, regulating the, um, the casino market, uh, what we call the, 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 the resort kind of casino market, but more um, focused on live casino in the casinos, in, 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 the, in, the, in the resorts. Now, since uh, 2010, when we re-entered the market, um, we found um, there was a uh, sports betting environment going on, most like more they, uh, Nigeria developed from pools betting to sports betting. Pools betting was always regulated by the, by the, the, the local, I, be, I believe I, I, I need to be uh, um, uh, corrected over here, but a pools betting license could be um, uh, applied for through the, the, the state. Um, I'm, I'm, more, I'm more in tune with Lagos State. Nigeria is huge, and, and uh, different states have got different, um, different uh, laws. Sports betting, as we know it today, was first regulated, as far as we are concerned, by the Lagos State Lottery Board. The Lagos State Lottery Board being um, uh, ha has a, 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 a good... Um, organized um, affair going on and so regulation in Nigeria has uh, uh, that's how we know regulation in Nigeria anyway. 
Okay. Um, I'm going to go to your hands, because obviously you sit, you sit in a very unique position here in Europe, talking to a lot of European type operators, compliance, regulatory, and some of the questions that you get hit regularly. So we've seen the reforms that have happened in Kenya and Tanzania. I'm sure that has affected some of your clients. So what are the, the biggest issues that you find a lot of your potential clients when they think about Africa? What, what do they get? So that we can then find out from Bemi Sola if you can help us you know, begin to answer some of these questions. I think one of the biggest challenges, um, clients who approach me uh, with questions regarding the African markets and um, uh, my assessment of the regulation and of compliance issues there, um, is usually a, a misperception or maybe wrong expectations of what we will find in, in the legislation there. And uh, what we have seen quite often is that um, the, the first approach or the first idea is that there's basically there's no regulation. And we are quite surprised that there actually is some regulation in some countries, but it looks different from what you're used to in Europe. So you get a, a, a very basic regulation one of the issues is actually that uh, often codes are not, not as accessible. You will not find them completely online. And uh, if you only look at the basic code, um, people still feel insecure. They feel too much uncertainty about what the regulation actually entails to be safe enough to actually enter these markets. So I think one of the aspects keeping companies back from entering the market is legal uncertainty and the lack of understanding what is really required. And uh, contacting regulators is sometimes quite difficult. Uh, reply to emails is difficult. Once you meet them, from my personal experience, it's a very open environment. It's uh, very, uh, very much um, uh, communication, more than you have in, in most European jurisdictions. So that's quite helpful. But then to translate this back into a European perception is very, very difficult. To explain that you might not get a license which has 20 pages of restrictions uh, is difficult to explain to compliance officer here. Okay, um, Sola, you sit on the re on the operator side as a lawyer. Yeah. How do you how do you see regulation has aided the growth of gaming, especially in Nigeria? You know, specifically over the past few years that you've seen firsthand. Yeah. Okay, I think regulation in Nigeria, as that's my that's where I practice, is it has always been there. It has always been there. But the problem we have is awareness. Because a lot of people feel there is no regulation, so it's always, it's always, they're always scared to come. But the regulation has always been, and I believe for every other African country, to, I, it's always been there. But to now talk about regulation catching up with technology, maybe that's where, where Nigeria is lagged behind a bit. The technology is growing fast. And to, for regulation to meet up with it, it has to be something that goes hand in hand. So regulation is there and um, it's, oh, it has always been there. But for anyone that wants to invest in Africa, it's just to come. Nothing is different from what is happening in Europe when it comes to our regulation in Africa. It has always been there. And um, as you come... I know there are, we, we, the, the regulators have this opportunity to make subsidiary le le legislation in cases where there are doubts. So the powers have always been in the law, and it's not that the regulations are not there. It's just for them to make the re subsidiary legislation to back up whatever they, they want at a particular time. Okay. So, yeah, back to you. Um, I've met a few op operators here who told me that, you know, we are compliant companies, we're listed, you know, we have all these things. Um, can you tell us, you know, can we go to Africa? So I'm going to ask you a very rudimentary question. Just give me a list of 10 countries in Africa that you would compare to good regulations as much as in Europe. Okay. Um, so that's a hard one. But there are loads anyway. And like I said earlier on, it all depends on which area you're looking at. Uh, back to what Brem Sola said, if you look at casino, which uh, Ivan is very, very uh, familiar with. As far back as 1964, they had a tax law. They had a casino tax law. Yeah. Uh, 2005, they came up with the casino laws and casino regulations. Of course, because that was a predominant uh, game at that period. Uh, before then, pools betting has always been big until about four or five years ago. So you find out that we have robust legislation and uh, regulations in that area. 
Um, again, if you go to Tanzania, they have their gaming laws as well. That was tilted towards uh, lottery. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously, I know they're in the process of looking at their, their uh, sports betting law because sports betting is, is huge as well there. Uh, South Africa is predominantly a casino-based uh, market and is a sports betting but retail-based market. So you can see that in the new draft laws they have, again, they still haven't dealt with the issue of remote gaming. They are still dealing with just strictly retail uh, uh, retail uh, based uh, sports betting, you know. Even the casinos are also retail based as well. So we have that situation. Uh, Mauritius just uh, simply in just uh, recently uh, engaged a uh, firm to help with their, uh, and they want to become a country like Malta using their double um, their double taxation agreement to all the other African countries to become a licensing uh, uh, jurisdiction as well. So um, if you look at the big markets, Botswana is a very well-regulated market. <coughs> it's a small market, but it's a rich country, two million people. Uh, they have very, very strong laws. And I think part of the laws in Malta says, in Botswana says, once you're licensed in Malta, you don't need to go through another licensing procedure in Botswana. All you need to do is to, uh, is to pay for the license fee. So obviously, they have used Malta as a gold standard for their own licensing processes. Um, South African, of course, uh, uh, sports betting licenses are by auction. So if you're going to the main hotel or any other main cities, it's pretty hard to get a license. But once you move out to the other, other provinces, you get uh, licenses. Rwanda, too, has very, very, very well written laws. But then it's not a strong market. With 10 million people, not a strong market. Uh, obviously, there are opportunities there. Uh, and some of the markets, too, you have to go look beyond the legislation. You have to look at what the opportunities present to you uh, and, the, and the, the body language of the regulators. Because if the regulators are ready to engage with the operators, then you have a very, very uh, good opportunity to basically even be part of the process of writing the laws. You know? So Nigeria, you cannot avoid it simply because of the, the population. Kenya is there. Uh, Ghana is a good market. Uh, I think I've called about seven countries. Um, Morocco, uh, most of North Africa, they're good for uh, poker. They're very good for poker. Uh, they have very strong uh, markets for poker there. Uh, I'm not too sure of where they stand when it comes to online. But obviously, with mobile tele uh, penetration, access to broadband, that remote gaming will also become uh, part and parcel of it. So I think uh, I've not even touched on the French-speaking countries, Cameroon. That's a, a, a good market as well, and I think not much is happening. You're just starting to witness uh, influx of operators, you know. I think I've done with over 10 countries, but practically, yeah. I think half of the countries in, 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 in Africa, over, which are 54 countries anyway, so half of that uh, reasonably give you size, market size. There's some kind of reasonable regulation you can work on. Uh, the problem is always navigating some of those issues because they're not clear cut in some cases. And that's why it's always good to use experts when you go to such jurisdictions so that you, you can navigate it. And um, yeah, we've been involved in even negotiating even licenses, I mean, proper license fees. Because sometimes when you meet regulators who do not have the capacity, they most likely will allow, ask you to pay license for a lottery. When in actual fact, what you need is just simple, a simple raffle or yeah, promotional, yeah. you know. So you need to have that kind of engagement with most of them. But by and large, it's, uh, and, and the big brands are coming in now. I mean, we, there was some kind of lethargy uh, some years ago, but I think the past one year, we've seen some of the big brands come in. Yeah. Okay. Ivan, then, back to you. Since, again, you operate, I mean, is it a question of expectation against what is currently existing that, you know, sort of puts up some of the international operators coming to Africa, or as um, Han said, is it a question of knowledge? What would you say is the real problem, Ivan? Well, <coughs> first of all, um, when when you when we did enter uh, Nigeria, we were not uh, we 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 did not uh, we were not expecting. We didn't know what to expect. The ask because we were used to the European laws, and these European laws were were very demanding in in, in their in their in their ask. We were pleasantly surprised in Nigeria that, that when we saw the application form, it was like a one and a half page application form. <laughs> it was very, no, but it was, 
It wasn't, it wasn't that it was just one and a half pages. It was very open in that, you know, it was, it was like, um, le 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 let us have your, your uh, business plan. Let us have your, 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 um, your, your way of operation. And it, it, um, it, it got us off guard a little bit. We didn't know how much, uh, how much to, to, to put out. But uh, we got our license, and I think that it was less scary. Was that your question? <laughs> no, it wasn't, was it? No. That's I think I was, uh, I was thinking of something else. <laughs> John, could you re-ask your question? <laughs> No, I mean, I'm basically saying, I mean, is it a question where European operators ex have an, a certain type of expectation, you know, in their mindset when they think about Africa? And from your experience, is that expectation, does it meet the reality on ground? Well, the expectation, I think, it, 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 would, would that be for, for regulation? Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. <coughs> As I said, uh, we were expecting sort of like very much a, a very strict form way of, of, of doing things. Um, it's not like that. Okay. It's demanding. It can be demanding. What I liked about, um, about I, I didn't know that Botswana actually uh, accepted the Maltese regulator as, as, as part of the standard. Um, I can welcome that. I think that uh, Africa should look not to reinvent the wheel and, and um, get on with regulation and enforcement in the country more than, more than trying to do what, what uh, we have done in Malta and, and uh, try and um, accept operators that have already gone through the Maltese jurisdiction or the UK jurisdiction or be it any other jurisdiction of, of any repute. Okay, so <coughs> is, it, is it fair then for most regular operators to expect a lot of these African jurisdictions to have similar regulations to Malta, because it's a question I keep getting asked all the time. I mean, in your assessment, and also you have a lot of these clients who come yes. to you. Um, I think it's not so much a matter of fairness, it's more a matter of, um, of really of understanding and cultural differences. And uh, what Ivan just described, uh, uh, this uh, very short one-pager uh, of license form, uh, is something which, uh, from my experience, uh, can almost cause fear uh, amongst <laughs> compliance officers who, are you, who come from, from a very much compliance-driven world nowadays. And especially when you enter African markets, uh, the, uh, you always have the questions of money laundering, terrorism financing in the back of your mind. And uh, if there's very little guidance while you come from uh, a regulatory environment which is completely driven by, by forms, applications, uh, requirements, that can be quite scary. And I think what people miss is uh, that it also offers a tremendous chance uh, to go into an open market and to operate there. Okay. Uh, so then what, what we're seeing is, you know, maybe, you know, again, another question people are asking us in Nigeria is what is the current situation between the states and the national? I mean, are we looking at uh, an America type situation? Or are we looking, you know, are these African countries learning from, you know, places like Malta? How would you um, relate to that question? One thing to be very clear of is that Nigeria operates the, the same type of system with the American system, where you have the federal and the states. The but I know presently both the state and federal are into talks, are in talks. They are talking on how to harmonize. And um, very soon we'll be having a single legislation on maybe remote gaming and the retail side of it, which is what I think the both regulators are trying to look at. Take because of maybe the federal should take the, uh, the remote gaming part while the state take the retail, which is what I'm not sure now, but I think they are, think, uh, they are talking towards that end. So the issue of um, federal state regulation will soon be a thing of the past. It is not something to scare investors away from Nigeria because it's not, we, like Ivan said, he has been operating in Nigeria and we, there is always a way around it. And um, I think very soon, the legis this will be very clear, very soon. Yeah, yeah, can you touch on that same question a little bit? Because again, you, Okay, so uh, actually, rightly said, Bimi rightly said, I know there are some ongoing discussions. 
Uh, how fruitful that discussion will be uh, remains to be seen. But uh, there are many ways around it. You know, so Nigeria is 36 states. Getting everybody on, t on the table is pretty hard. It's not that easy. Mm -hmm. That's the truth of it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think in practice, people separate retail, as in that's for the states, mm -hmm. and uh, remote gaming for national. Yeah. That, is the, that, that is basically the, the way the approach, that's the approach for most, most people. Uh, but then they, we still have to deal with issues of taxes. You know, okay, so who am I paying, you know? But anyway, the important thing is this, that there's some ongoing uh, discussions between uh, some of the states and the federal. Now, for most European countries which are remote gaming, which are remote based, they are web-based, web I don't think, I think it's a very simple issue because the latest judgment says the national lottery is in charge of interstate commerce. Yeah. And remote gaming is interstate commerce. So for People who are, are not going to have any kind of retail outfit is a very, very straightforward case. Go to national, get your license, and you're insulated from any kind of attack. But what happens is when you're having a combination of retail and then online, then you start wondering what do you do. What do, you do? Some of our clients have simply said, you know what, let's just get the two licenses. Whether it's smart is another thing, but some people say, you know what, it's not even worth our while. You know. We're all scared that we're going to get taxed twice, actually. What? <laughs> we're all scared that we're going to get taxed twice. <laughs> We've got those licenses. <laughs> Let's hope we don't get taxed you twice. <laughs> so um, some have decided to go that way. Uh, and for those who really think that retail is a core part of their whole strategy, they remain with the states. Because with the proper license from the state, you can still get all your integrations done at, at, at the, with the telcos and all of that stuff. You understand? And, um, so and as a matter of fact, I think um, the states, if you talk of states, is the federal and the state gov legal state government. Most states in Nigeria would prefer to look up to federal government to do it for them because they don't have the, they don't have the tec technical know-how to do this. Unlike legal states that started it first, has all the regulations and everything in place, which is what it is now, and it is either you have the Lagos license or the federal, which are the two competitive licenses now in Nigeria. Okay. Yeah, but uh, things, things have moved beyond that mm. in the sense that so many people are waking up to the reality of it. Yeah. It's the revenue, the tax uh, revenue stream for most of the states. Yeah. Uh, Anambra has taken since then. I mean, mm. there are lots of, I mean, Anambra has taken off. Uh, River State is almost there. Okay. So most of the key states that have a large population and lots of commercial activity. So when you say population, how, what is the average population so of these states? So the average population of every, any state in Nigeria is 5 million. Uh, that's average. 5 million people, sorry. You know? But uh, it goes only higher. From 5 million, it goes only higher. You know? And so uh, most of these states have, are already in that process. Some have already set up their own gaming boards as well. Mm. well Either way you look at it, it's going to be a give and take. Yeah, we're running out of time, so yeah. um, just one final word from you, Hans. How, how do you see the um, effect of regulation on the big international operators coming to Africa, and what would you like to see from a compliance point of view? Well, ideally, um, we, we wouldn't see a fragmentation of um, licensing regimes in Africa as we've seen it in Europe. I think Europeans missed a big chance 10 years ago uh, by ending up with national jurisdictions, each separate for gaming. And ideally, one would see, and I think it's also the, the title of the panel, some kind of pan-African approach, uh, where at least parts of the licenses are recognized mutually so that um, operators would not have to go to every single regulator and go through the same procedure again and again and again, potentially even having to establish an establishment in every country. Evan, last word from you. I feel like um, I would like to see less fragmentation and that, that we have not. Um, but all in all, I think that, again, Nigeria is, a, um, is moving in the right direction and that now there is, there is a collaboration between, between one major state and the federal and federal has decided that we're going to go uh, remote as, as, uh, as, as, uh, through the federal. Um, 
I would like to see a harmonization, though. I'd, okay. I'd like to see a settled environment. Yeah, yeah. Final word from you. Yeah, on pan pan African regulation, I think there is going to be a dual. I mean, that's come from both sides, both from the regulators and the operators. So uh, you hear lots of people. I mean, we all know there are standard regulations in any 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 uh, jurisdiction. Data protection is important. Responsible gambling is important. Most of the principles that govern these regulations are basically one and the same. They don't change too mm. much. Whether there's a law regarding that or not, as a, an operator, you should be able to implement that without even being asked. You know? So I think it's going to be both ways. And over time, you're going to see a harmonization of these laws, at least some kind of uniformity. Taxes might be different, but over time, these things will catch up. Bemi? Yeah. For those interested in Africa, Africa is open, and I must say that African regulators are always willing to learn, especially from Europe, because um, anything we get here, we know, anything they get from Europe, they know it's always authentic. So it's open to everybody. It's open to everybody, and when you get to them, from my experience, they are, they are, they are willing to learn. If you give them what is good, and they see it, they, it's always welcome. So everybody is invited to Africa. Thank you. Um, just on the final note, I mean, the, the African um, ecosystem of regulation, I would say, after being to over 28 countries in Africa in the past year and a half, has grown faster than most operators actually know. I mean, a number of the African countries have clear regulations around sports betting, lottery, casinos. Those are the basic properties that people trade. So, um, when you deep, dive deep a little bit further into, okay, what about remote gambling? What about um, taxation? Again, there's very clear cost information around taxation, what you do, what market you go into. So we've seen a lot of growth in the Africa. We've seen a, a growth margin of 115% year on year for the past few years in a number of different countries. And we've seen a number of big operators who are now coming into the market. I mean, we work with quite a, some of the biggest operators now who are now finding Africa an opportunity. So I don't think regulations to stop you. I think the regulations are there enough to allow you to enter the market and not compromise your business in any way. And so I think that you can also bring your knowledge to help the African markets grow. Thank you very much. And uh, you can talk to any of our panels later. Thanks. Thank you. Responsible gambling. Sustainability for committed operators. Understand the mechanics, initiatives, best practices, flaws and challenges within responsible gaming. Jack Simons. Gamban. Good afternoon. Um, I've got 10 minutes to talk about something that I could easily fit into three hours, but uh, let's get started. My name is Jack Simmons. Um, I'm founder and CEO of Gamban. I'm also a recovering problem gambler, um, and I'm going to try and fit what I think um, some of the lessons. This is going to come at you as a sort of haphazard brain dump uh, because of the time constraints, but let's go. In 2003, Bill Edington proposed four stages of responsible gambling, from denial to lip service to halfway house to full commitment. I would suggest this is an oversimplification and a sign of 2003 and how times have progressed. But I would say this is where we are at the moment. And between the edges of full commitment, certainly we're seeing some operators committing to responsible gambling, a term I hate, by the way, and we're going to come on to this shortly. Um, we're also seeing um, some operators, bad operators, um, bringing the industry down as a whole. And I'm going to make a point, and I hope this resonates, that it does not matter how responsible or sustainable your business is, it is in an industry that is unsustainable. And so it is in all of our interests to get this right. I'm approaching this, I'm familiar with the UK Gambling Commission and the UK regulatory, uh, UK as a jurisdiction. Um, and really the only thing I feel qualified to talk about today is protecting vulnerable people. Um, crime and keeping that out of gambling and 
gambling and conducted in a fair and open way is clearly important. That's one of the three tenets of the UKGC. But vulnerable people should be protected. And at the moment, we're letting down a lot of people, uh, and we're letting people slip in through the gaps. Um, these are the risks. We've seen penalties. I'm aware that in the UK, we've got about 90 investigations going on at the moment into operators. Um, it's just money. But we're talking about more important things here. We're talking about reputational harm to operators. We're talking about social harm to people, people whom you have a responsibility to. We're talking about licenses being revoked. We've been talking, actually, this week about certain licenses that look like they may be revoked. And we're talking about vigilantes. And by that, I don't mean dangerous vigilantes necessarily, but dangerous to your business. We're talking about activists, campaigners, people like us who come into the market because nothing is being done to protect at-risk individuals. Um, we talk about how problem gamblers and gamblers have problems. The industry has a problem. It does not matter what any one operator does. It matters what you do collectively. If I, I'll talk about self-exclusion in a second. Um, my, my reason for responsible gambling being some, a term that I'm not that comfortable with, I've got a list of reasons why I hate the term. Um, it does imply that responsibility is down to the player and not the product. And now that we've, we've seen huge numbers of problem gamblers coming through, it's time the industry takes more responsibility. Do it right and we're going to avoid a lot of the consequences of other, shall we say, vices. And I'm going to go through what we've seen with the uh, alcohol industry, cigarettes and smoking, and gambling as well. We have an opportunity here um, we, to get it right. Um, Las Vegas and Atlantic City and the, the offline product, uh, it's about Siegfried and Roy, it's about the experience. Um, rather than the product. So online is always going to be more about product than it is about experience. I fully understand that, but there are some takeaways and lessons that we can learn from that. Um, at the moment, what I see, uh, I see operators moving very close towards the solution um, and not trying to tackle the problem. By that, I mean one operator that, we've been, uh, that we're aware of is soon to be offering therapy. To me, this seems too close. There are organizations, certainly in the UK, we've got Gamble Aware and their network of treatment, um, Gamcare, Breakeven, Ara. We've got lots of different treatment options. It shouldn't come from an operator. And I'm trying to take responsibility away from operators so as to make it easier and clearer where the support is and where the entertainment is. Um, poor control over bad operators links back to the first slide. Um, good operators ones that we're aware of are more responsible. And notice I, I talk about operators being responsible rather than the irresponsibility in general. I think that's important. Um, good operators are brought down by bad ones. Um, I'm going to skip over this because I don't have time. Self-exclusion. Yeah, self-exclusion. I talk about self-exclusion not just because I'm qualified to do so most, but because it is flawed and because it's one of the most important things we need to get right. It is the bare minimum. At the moment, I can self-exclude from one casino, and I'm excluded from that casino and possibly their brands. I can sign up to thousands more. It is utterly pointless for a problem gambler. We know full well, we've seen that they will move to other sites, especially where bonuses are being offered. We've, we've seen promiscuity from a customer base. And believe me, players, certainly problem gamblers, are not brand loyal. They're the opposite, brand disloyal. They'll go to wherever the game is, wherever they'll be able to get, uh, get their fix. So circumvention happens both on the site itself. On, you might have players who have excluded or self-excluded. They'll come back to you with a different name or an email and get through. And we're seeing fines going through for failing to protect these players. Um, we are seeing um, national self-exclusion schemes crop up. So we, obviously, we've got Gamstop in the UK, um, Oasis in Germany, Rufus uh, in Finland. Um, and these are good. They rely on the industry to take part. Unfortunately, not all of industry does. This is where we come in, Gamban, um, alongside Gamstop um, or other self-exclusion uh, systems and financial, trend, financial spend blocking as well. Our view is this represents friction. Nothing is going to be 100% effective, and that's OK. The main thing, the thing that stops Innovation is striving for perfection. What we offer is an effective barrier. In 2018, I am unable to gamble online thanks to these three tools. 
and that's a really good position. I would encourage all operators to embrace tools like this um, and, and use them. Work with us. We're here. This is the possible future of gambling if left unchecked. Not just the same color, but we're seeing we can learn a lot from the way that cigarettes have, um, that the smoking, the cigarette industry has, has moved. You notice now they're looking at putting, um, I don't know if they already have, but labels on the actual cigarettes. I would expect fully within the next five years that we'll see responsible gambling messages within the game as well. And if that doesn't ruin the, the enjoyment of the game, I don't know what will. Getting in front of this is the most important thing if we want to keep this an industry that is entertaining and fun um, and not about danger and risk. I've done my best to sort of compare with other vices. Gambling, I would say, fits into the middle. I don't think you can smoke responsibly. I may be wrong. Um, I know that we've moved. Uh, smoking used to be cool. It's now sort of gone through that process where you have, in the UK certainly, you have to go outside, and it's just seen as a sort of one of the, just an addiction. Um, gambling has the kind of James Bond and formal uh, thing to it still, particularly offline. Um, it has the event and social aspect to it, um, but it's also online is seen as increasingly uncool, problematic, and all the media representation of problem gambling positions it as a, as a problematic and unhelpful product. Um, whereas alcohol is generally considered, in moderation, a good thing. Um, you're considered a bit strange if you don't drink, and I, th I think that's a bit of a, a, a shame, but the idea that a glass of red wine is fine we can get back to a punt is OK, a flutter is OK. At the moment, though, we've got a lot of work to do. And this is what players are thinking about responsible gambling um, techniques that are deployed. Um, what goes through the mind of a problem gambler? Um, checks on the withdrawal. They should be done at deposit. Um, we've got 30 seconds left. Um, I'll only deposit a little bit. That went quickly. Now let's deposit some more. Um, not going to get through that. It doesn't need to be a race to the bottom. I come here, I, I'm naturally quite negative towards the industry, but I think there are opportunities and we would like to help. Doing the bare minimum and more. Um, I made this point before, having a sustainable business it means nothing if you're in an unsustainable industry and you really need to get on to the, uh, uh, the bad players who are bringing the industry down and bringing it back. Um, we're here, we can help. I've run out of time, but if anyone wants to talk, we're around for the rest of uh, Sigma. Thanks.